Um, hello and welcome. Let's see here. Getting back to my notes. Uh, this uh, meeting of the Centennial School Board of Education is called to order at 6.30 p.m. on 1-25-2023. Um, hello and welcome. I'm really glad that you all are here. And those of us joining us virtually, I just really appreciate um, your time and attention. Um, let's see here. The Where's my agenda? I've got multiple screens here. Um, let's see here. So the meeting agenda has been distributed in board pack. Are there any amendments to the agenda? Yes. Um, one of the last things on the agenda last time was polling us about whether we wanted a second reading of the abuse reporting policy and the minutes leave out that I wanted to continue to do a second read. So if the record could be changed to reflect that, that's the only thing I saw. Great. Can I get a motion to approve the agenda with the adjustment? Motion to approve. Second. All those in favor, raise your hand and say aye. 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 Uh, unanimous. Uh, the agenda has passed. Um, keep looking in front of me for my notes on, it, on the screen. Um, introduction of guests. I don't believe we have any guests on the call today. James, is there anyone that you'd like to? Nope. No, we don't. But good to see everybody virtually. We haven't done this in a while. Yeah. All right. So let's the previous minutes have been distributed in your board pack. Are there? Nope. Sorry. Nope. That's the right one. Not the agenda. The minutes. Sorry. Uh, the previous minutes draft has been distributed in your board book. Are there any questions? I think what Director Gregory might have been referencing was the minutes. I'm I'm just yeah. getting that now because I was confused too. So I got ahead of myself. Yes, you sir. did. Yeah. And I, yeah, we didn't catch it. You're totally fine. So we kind of did, we did the agenda and now let's just double check and, and the minutes. Was there anything adding Gregory's, uh, Director Gregory, Gregory's addition? All those in favor? Oh no. Can I get a motion to approve? Motion to approve. I'll second the motion to approve the minutes. Perfect. All those in favor, raise your hand and say aye. 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 It passes unanimously. Um, public forum is up next. I, and I haven't seen any emails come through. Missy has, nope, nothing coming through. Okay. I, I thought that one from uh, Let's and Diane Crane, doesn't that count as public forum? That public, public, they, oh, go ahead. You know, go ahead, James. Oh, public forum as the process is described on the website is different than a letter to the board, but it may be uh, good just okay. for, yeah, to just clue people in on what that was about. Yeah, we got, oh, Pam, do you want to, Director Shields? For work sessions, we usually do not have public forum. Right. We only do that at the uh, first meeting of each of the month, which is the official board meeting. And it would be completely, um, you know, just a, a, uh, an off situation where we would entertain public input as if we had requested it for a specific work, se work session topic. But otherwise we don't do it during board meetings. Just helps because work sessions are work sessions. <laughs> However, in this case, since it's the second read of that policy, you know, I think we would have taken public comment before we, we went forward to approve it, right? I mean, not necessarily. Not necessarily. Okay. Not necessarily, because it's already on the agenda. And it was on the agenda last time. Public input could have been uh, brought in at that time. They would have known that we would have been talking about it a second time and could have, you know, given additional input which then at the discretion of the chair, the chair could have included in the record. But right. yeah, but normally we just, because our, our work session time is sort of sacred time because of how, how much we always have to cover. So we try to limit those other normal and customary board processes to just the one meeting. 
Thank you. And, yeah, thanks, Pam. All right, we can move on to reports then. Um, would you care to introduce the first report, James? Will do. So we have two bond related reports tonight. The first is our bond quarterly report. I believe we have Scott Rose, our owner's rep from RNC in the gallery. If we can advance um, Scott to the panelist, um, he will join Paul Southerton, our director of business and operations in providing our quarterly report. After that report is provided, then we will have Bond Oversight Committee Chair Rod Betcher and Director Southerton um, providing the annual report for the Bond Oversight Committee. So I will go ahead and pass it over to Director Southerton to uh, queue us up. Excellent. Thank you, Superintendent Owens. Uh, thanks for having us here tonight. And it looks like we've got Scott Rose joining us. Scott, would you like to share your screen or would you like me to share the screen for the quarterly report? Uh, I can certainly certainly share it. Uh, I think Rod and I were going to kind of tag team on this and kind of do the BOC and the quarterly report at the same time, or or we can do them one after the other if that works better. Yeah, is Rod with us? I didn't see him in the participants. Um, Rod's having computer issues where he's working on it now, and I'll alert Missy when he's able to get in. Fantastic. Okay. And his will tie nicely into ours, so we can proceed with the quarterly update, and then uh, Ron, Rod will be able to join us as he's able. Okay, fantastic. Okay, so yes, I will go ahead and share my screen here. Uh, let's see, it's great. It should work. And let's see, do you see my report, the cover? We'll we do. Perfect. Okay. Let me put this in uh, presentation mode. Do you still see it in presentation mode? No. Okay. No, we don't. Oh, okay. Then I'm not going to do that. <laughs> I'll just leave it. I'll leave it the way it is then. Okay. Perfect. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. Uh, yes, this is our quarterly report for the uh, status update of each of the projects. And I'll go th through this. Um, at a reasonable pace, just to make sure that I respect other issues that you have to discuss tonight. Um, I think it important, and these, this is, you have a copy of this packet, so you can certainly read this at your leisure and then ask me questions um, outside of this format uh, if you want. But I want to reiterate with each of our quarterly reports, all the work that's been completed. I think that's really important that we don't lose track of. We've been doing this work now for two years. And so there's a lot of work that's been done. And uh, so we want to make sure that everybody's uh, aware of all the, the good work that's been done uh, on the bond. Uh, you can see here Centennial High School, the middle school, and Oliver Middle School, uh, just a, a, a lot of work that's been accomplished here, recently finished up. Um, the elementary schools look a little bit light because they've got a whole lot of work going on right now. And so those will start to become complete and uh, and start to flesh out these lists as well. Uh, but this work goes back as far as uh, spring of uh, 20, uh, 21 rather. And uh, so the, a lot of a lot of good work taking place. Uh, I want to really focus though on the the work in progress because I know there's lots of questions about well when is that work being done or getting done. We have uh, three district wide projects um, that are affecting. Uh, most every site in the district, uh, the mechanical system upgrades, uh, those continue to uh, uh, be under construction and will be throughout the course of the remaining school year. Um, the uh, uh, work at Meadows, Park Lane, Patrick Lynch, Powell Butte, and even CMS are all nearing completion. Uh, the equipment has come with the exception of one more rooftop unit that's scheduled to arrive next month. And they will be um, doing the programming, or they're in the middle of doing the programming for the controls right now. And so we'll start to see, uh, we've already started to see um, increased comfort in, in spaces. We've had a couple areas that have been sort of runaway valves that we've had to go check and calibrate accordingly. Um, but generally speaking, we're now able to see in many spaces, most spaces uh, in these schools, what the temperatures are in the spaces, um, what the CO2 levels are in the spaces, I'm better able to diagnose any um, day-to-day uh, -day maintenance issues. So um, the last four sites, the high school, Pleasant Valley, Oliver, and Butler Creek, 
those uh, will come uh, into play as soon as we uh, are out of the heating season. So we'll start working on those in earnest probably in April and May and get those valves changed over in the new control system. What's nice is you are going away from an air system or pneumatic system into a, a computerized digital system, which will allow us to better diagnose, as I mentioned. Security systems, we're waiting on cameras. I just gave the approval today on a handful of about a dozen more access control system uh, components that are uh, gonna be uh, shipped your way and get those installed. You'll have seen in a lot of the schools, we have new security vestibules, but they're not electrified yet. We're waiting on those, uh, those parts to get those installed. Um, but you're continuing to move forward into a more and more secure environment. Exterior lighting, that was something that the board just recently uh, approved to move program contingency over. And so uh, exterior lighting, those design proposals were received. We're reviewing those right now and that work will get underway. Centennial High School, the track resurfacing, um, that uh, uh, was awarded to Biden. That work will happen this summer. Intercom system, we're in the middle of designing that right now. Tier two roof repairs and uh, single stall restrooms. Again, early on in the design work, that's all added projects beyond your original bond scope. Um, Meadows Elementary, uh, all of the gymnasiums. The gymnasiums, uh, we have uh, really struggled with a particular subcontractor that unfortunately impacts multiple systems and multiple finishes, um, primarily the sheet metal. Um, that affects the siding, that affects the roof flashing, it affects the flashing around the doors and windows. So it has been uh, an ongoing struggle with that subcontractor um, in terms of their performance. Uh, we do have the sheet metal uh, all in possession and it's being uh, bent and shaped now to go on the building. So that'll happen throughout February and March. We're optimistic that we're gonna get these uh, gymnasiums turned over uh, by spring break. And uh, that we will, uh, as I'm sure you've heard, we have electrical switch gear that will be replaced at three of the four sites that will happen over the summer. So there'll be a short downtime then. Um, but we'll have uh, temporary power up in all those. Uh, fire alarm systems, we have uh, five new fire alarm systems around the district. Those are ready to swap over. Those are all fully installed. We just haven't made them live yet. Uh, we're just ironing out a monitoring agreement and we'll be able to get those uh, hot and up and then we'll take out the old system. So right now you have two fire alarm systems in five-year schools, um, one active and one about to be. So. Uh, roofing is all on the dry. Um, we've had a couple leak issues here and there that we've been checking based on some uh, uh, warranty work, but generally speaking, the roofs are in really good shape. Security vestibules, as I mentioned before. Um, windows, uh, we're placing many windows over at Meadows. That will take place over spring break. Uh, it's fairly intrusive work, so we're making sure we push that out um, to a non-student time. And then playgrounds. Uh, Patrick Lynch's playground is almost complete and Meadows has started. So this is uh, really exciting for them. Uh, their gymnasiums uh, uh, displaced their play areas, Powell Buttes and Park Lanes to a lesser extent. Uh, so they're very excited about getting the new playground equipment. That playground equipment was actually selected by staff and students through a survey in those schools at Meadows and Patrick Lynch. So they're very excited about taking that and actually rolling that into something that's real that the kids can see. That they had uh, that they had a part in in selecting. Uh, Centennial Middle School, uh, the cooling project that the board approved uh, last month. We've actually already got that designed. We've got that priced, and they have ordered the equipment. So we are pushing really hard on Centennial Middle School cooling to try and get that done here by the um, uh, by the time uh, uh, school gets out. Uh, we are also working on cooling at four other sites, but that's primarily through the ESSER funds. Uh, but I want to note that, that we have got a price on that, but we're trying to value engineer that and bring that cost down. Uh, but the intention is also to get that equipment up by the time that school gets out as well. So as you have a robust summer school program, you'll be able to utilize those. And those are targeted air conditioning. It's not throughout the whole school, but it's where we would identify where we would accomplish summer school activities. Um, Oliver, the fire alarm, Pleasant Valley. Pleasant Valley, our ongoing seismic improvement project. Um, <laughs> it's, uh, there is a light at the end of that tunnel. Uh, most of the brick is up. We are identifying February 8th as the completion of brick. That's the, the date the contractor's given us right now. And they're following right behind him with uh, a little bit of siding at the gable ends. Once they get that done, then they'll be primarily just working in the basement and the attic. 
uh, and we're we're putting together a schedule to see if we can't get that done um, right around by the time of spring break. A lot of that will depend on some city approvals and whether or not that makes that extend into April or not. But uh, the work is very doable. We're working with them on some um, cost reduction measures right now. Uh, site storm drainage, we passed a land use hurdle, so we're very close there. And the Butler Creek boiler replacement, uh, we're just starting to scope that out. Uh, park lanes can be much like meadows. I, I won't go into a, a great uh, level of detail there. Do note that our interior lighting replacement projects are all done with the exception of just a little bit of area where we have to do some abatement next summer. And we've started to see the checks roll in for that. We just got the check uh, today for the lighting replacement at Meadows, which is uh, exciting. That was a little over $30,000. So um, we continue to um, get that work done and get those um, uh, checks coming in. And I'll, I'll show you that in the grant summary. Patrick Lynch, again, I kind of went over that when I went over with Meadows, uh, same sort of uh, situation, looking to turn things over spring break. Cal Butte lagging a little bit behind the others, but uh, as other subcontractor trades free up, we'll be able to uh, bring them into Cal Butte to help accelerate that piece as well. Uh, ESSER projects, as I was mentioning, additional asbestos abatement, doors and window replacement. Uh, there's something uh, for the local contract review board tonight uh, to take a look at perhaps combining these projects under a single CMGC to try and expedite that work as well. So we'll talk more about that later this evening. Uh, and the stadium parking and turf project. Uh, it's uh, in design, construction period of May 15th, to August 18th. Uh, that is That design is going really well. We're getting close to the end there. We uh, have an estimate reconciliation to work through. The contractor gave us an estimate, the designers gave us an estimate, and they're a bit apart. So we got to figure out what uh, um, who's interpreting correctly and not. So, um, but we just got that information this morning. So we're working through that, and uh, I anticipate that'll continue to move forward uh, here next week. Budget summary. Uh, so uh, you'll see something that I don't want it to alarm anybody, but down there, bond program contingency shows zero dollars. That's because we moved everything up to the added contingency projects. So. Um, that's very intentional. That was in our uh, meeting last month. So that's the tier two roofing, that's the intercom, the restrooms, the boilers, um, the exterior lighting, the CMS cooling. Uh, so all of those components uh, are, make up at that uh, $4.3 million. The roofing project is designed and will be ready to go out on the street here in the next week or two. The cooling project, as I mentioned, is already designed, uh, bid, awarded, and they've ordered the materials. So we've got a couple of those moving along at a really uh, fast pace. Um, the restrooms over at CHS, I uh, coordinated with Marin. We're gonna actually get some student input on those restrooms and where those go uh, next month. And so then we'll be able to launch that and get that going. So exciting things happening there. Grant summary, uh, exciting stuff here. I've not had a chance to uh, update that since the checks I received this morning. <laughs> but um, the uh, Meadows lighting, we got that uh, check coming in. That actually was a couple hundred dollars more than what I'm showing there, uh, the 37,000 and change. And we also uh, received the, the smaller one for the lighting in the four gymnasiums. So where I've highlighted in yellow, I've walked those sites with the Energy Trust of Oregon and they have approved your projects. So we're just waiting on the checks. And like I say, two of those have already come in. Then these in green here, are letters that we're expecting from the Oregon Department of Energy that says you are authorized to spend those dollars that are already in your account. Uh, I've not seen those letters yet, so we've been inquiring about those to make sure that we can uh, leverage those funds and move those into the bond to uh, recover the cost that we spent on uh, mechanical and lighting upgrades. But um, still uh, uh, a lot of uh, uh, great um, grant money to really help uh, again, extend a lot of your projects along. Uh, use of locals. I, I just gave a summary sheet tonight because uh, we haven't let a lot of construction since our last uh, grants or since our last locals uh, spreadsheet. So just wanted to remind you again where we were sitting with our construction awards is over 10% of your construction contracts have been let with companies within five miles of the district office. And that's that's great to see. And then you can see here within 20 miles, a little over half of them, 
and three out of four dollars spent uh, within 30 miles uh, of the district office. So um, that's that's uh, should be uh, uh, celebrating that. That's fantastic. Pleasant Valley. Uh, for those that walked with me uh, in December to take a look at Pleasant Valley, none of this brick was on up front, and now it is. And so we've got most of the brick done, as I mentioned. We should be able to wrap up uh, by February 8th, all the brick there. We did have to infill a few basement windows, uh, uh, just to, again for the stability and the seismic stability of the, of the building. Uh, the pool, uh, I showed you last month that the uh, pool was all complete. This is just the last thing that we were waiting on was the diving board. Uh, uh, Rod wanted to make sure that it could uh, fold up out of the way um, when he it was not in use, and we're just they were just testing that to make sure that that's all operational. So they have been swimming in there. The students have been swimming in there for almost two months. Uh, I think their first meet was December eighth, so that was exciting. So that was a while back. So they're they're very happy with their pool. Um, job photos are showing you again some of these security vestibules starting to go into the schools. This is a Pal Butte. Um, well, obviously it's without the doors uh, at, the, at this juncture, but that's what they look like. They're really retrofitting in an existing lobby space. Uh, we're also doing things, including putting in uh, coiling doors here at the ticketing counter at the theater at the high school. He's just measuring the line of where that's actually gonna go. Um, but we'll be able then to secure that ticketing counter as well. That tends to be uh, an area that a lot of unauthorized users get behind. And so by putting in that gate, we're able to better secure that. Uh, meadows, uh, just an example of the ceramic tile that's going up in the bathrooms. These are going to be very colorful, very bright spots, um, uh, bright additions, the gymnasium additions overall at each of the four sites. Uh, you can see the safety padding up installed here. There's a lot of good things going on in the gymnasium. When you only look at it from the outside, you're not you know, really seeing all the finishes and the wood floor going down and that kind of thing. Uh, furniture arrives for the PE offices and the storage rooms next week. And so we won't be waiting on any of that um, when we uh, open up the gymnasium. Uh, at Oliver, uh, this is an example. We now have this at seven of the nine school sites, roof rollers, we call them. And these are climbing deterrents. We have many industrious people around the district that think it's good to climb on your roof. We don't think it's good to climb on your roof. So, so we have, uh, uh, this went through a lot of different study with your security professionals, with contractors, um, with you know talking to other school districts to find what's a good deterrent. We wanna try and get away from some of the more um, uh, potentially hazardous uh, deterrents like a razor ribbon and barbed wire and go with something like this. So the intention is that, yeah, these are big sort of wide rolling pins. And when you try to leverage uh, a position at a lower low climbing point, uh, they can't get a good handhold on it. And so they, they can't hoist themselves up. So, And then this is just an example of, uh, we replaced the electrical service switch gear at Oliver. This was done over winter break. So there was no impact to students. They started this December 19th and finished it in, in three and a half days. And it was fantastic. So Oliver went from, a, uh, I believe a 1200 amp service to a 1600 amp service. So we have a lot more power capacity at Oliver than we did before. And that will also happen at three other schools, Park Lane, uh, Powell Butte, and Meadows. They will all go from 800 amp to 1200 amps. They will also get power upgrades. So that's exciting, exciting for them. And then I think the last slide I've got here is just showing you that um, over at Patrick Lynch, we have put down all the sub floor for the new wood gym flooring. And these bundles that you see on the plywood here um, that's the actual plank flooring. And so my understanding is that's going to start getting applied um, not next week, but the following week. We're still working through some thermal control issues. We'll want to make sure that um, we've got the humidity controlled and the temperature controlled so we don't have wood wanting to swell. Um, so again, uh, uh, exciting there. We're getting really close to getting, getting done with these gymnasiums. And just a, a token picture of your track at the high school, just reminding everybody that that work is going to get started. We are actually going to be putting in the con contractors hall road, April 26th, 27th, and 28th. That's Wednesday, Thursday, Friday that we don't have students in school. They're going to bring a hall road in from 174th to the track uh, because we have to haul out at least 8,000 yards of dirt. So we need a place for trucks to go. <laughs> so you've added a lot of dirt on that field over the years. And so uh, so we'll be hauling that out and we're looking at 
cost um, uh, effective ways of doing that, including we had a wonderful meeting last week with the National Guard. And we may have a great opportunity to actually utilize the National Guard to remove most of that dirt. And that comes at no cost to you. That's part of their IRT program that was established, I believe, during the Clinton administration. And uh, that is for uh, training National Guard people for things that they would do elsewhere in the world. And part of what they do is they do have to move a lot of dirt if they're setting up a camp in another country or something to that effect. They have to be able to move dirt fast and, and basically set up temporary camps. Um, so they were very excited about this opportunity of community service. And so we're continuing to work out the details, but with any luck, May 15th, we could have National Guard out there moving dirt. So, so that will help with your bottom line as we take a look at overall our costs. Kind of went through that quickly, uh, or maybe not, I don't know, depending on your perspective. So <laughs> question, questions or concerns that you might have about anything that I shared. Go ahead, Director Hardin. Uh, yeah, Scott, thank you for the update. Uh, it's really great to see this once again come along. I really appreciate your time and energy in, in the projects. Um, one question I had was around the targeted cooling or targeted projects. When the time comes and we want to expand the cooling in the middle school throughout the whole building, mm -hmm. are we going to be able to access, is it going to be easy to branch it in? Or do we have to kind of take it out and start from scratch? Great question. Um, and I would say that neither is the answer um, in that what we're putting in is a unit size for the rooms that it's adjacent to. And so it's sort of a standalone system. When you add more cooling, you will put in another unit that will attack another six rooms and another unit that will attack another six rooms. So what we're doing it is a very phased and very, I'll say, scalable solution. So it's very scalable, but you will not have to take anything out ever to put in more cooling, but it's not sized. We didn't size the unit to handle the whole school and just doing a few rooms. We had to size it you know, economically for doing six rooms at a time, so yes. So you won't have to take anything out, but um, you won't necessarily be adding to that particular unit either. But that solution will be very applicable to any you know, next group of rooms you wanna do. It, it can be repeatable. Okay. Yeah, I would only add to that that um, that's typical in uh, buildings of this size. So if you see any buildings being built of this size, when we're talking about hundreds of thousands of square feet, you're mm -hmm. not and or you're not wanting necessarily a singular unit that's right. going to be providing all the air for um, for the entire building. One, it's incredibly large and heavy, and the engineering that would go into that to support that size of a unit um, would be incredibly expensive. Um, it's not ne necessarily economical to run lines from one central unit all the way across to school. It's easier to do it in sections, right? And then if you do have a singular unit and that goes down, the cost of replacement is ex exponentially higher than if you're replacing one of 20 smaller units when that when a unit fails. Um, so this is a very scalable um, solution that is commonplace now. That's Can that great. be controlled centrally? Good. Yes, it will be controlled centrally. I mean, it's on. It'll be on your DDC system, your direct digital control system. Yes. So absolutely. even if you had twenty separate units, it's not like you've got twenty separate control centers scattered about the school. No, no, one control center. Now each one will have their own stat, of course, in the room. You know, to control the temperature in that room. But it all goes back to one central brain, and that brain is sized to handle the whole building. Yes. So you won't be re replacing a controller later. It all goes back to the cent central system. And then we're able to control that at the district level as well. So um, for my desktop computer and from our director of facilities um, computers, we can see all the schools and all the systems and we can adjust stats as needed um, or uh, troubleshoot them as well. And so the cooling will be tied into that just as the heating is. Yep. So will the teachers individually have a any available or any ability to adjust the temperature in their classrooms? Absolutely. We typically have it set to a range. So we have a target set point of maybe 68 or 70 degrees. And then they have a range of a, you know, three to four degrees above, three to four degrees below. So they can adjust it for their comfort level. Great. Thank you. Students' comfort level. Yeah. And we're able to monitor both those, both 
the the eternal set point as well as what the teacher has set it at. So right. we can look and see that. Yeah. And that's our current practice with our system right now. Teachers have that ability with the heating, so that it will be the same with the cool. Other questions from the board? I had a couple. Um, I was curious that Hall Road, um, whereabouts is that going to be going through? Will there be an impact to uh, spring baseball or other things that use some of that property back there? Uh, great question. Uh, it is going to be going between the baseball and the soccer field. And no, we've been coordinating that very closely with uh, uh, Dante, your athletic director, to make sure that we're going to avoid all those activities. In fact, we're going to utilize part of the hall road when all is said and done as a staging area for your soccer goals when they're not on the field. Because right now they they sit on the grass and it's difficult to sort of coordinate and navigate with maintenance for cutting the grass and the like. So actually leveraging that. But uh, but no, it won't be in the way of any of spring sports. You confirm that with Dante. Awesome. The other question I had, correct me if I'm wrong, did I hear something about the windows at Meadows not being able to be put in yet? Or something the the new windows for the existing building correct are they those the ones that i from. see when i drive by 182nd a, a bunch of windows out there in the field at meadows the that may be some of those windows no no I'm no sorry <laughs> sorry scott I didn't want to that's okay down. those are the windows for the gymnasium so oh, okay. Okay. they're building the they're putting in the flashing and building the store yeah for those now and then they'll put in the glazing so the glazing actually arrived before the flashing and okay. the framing which is called the storefront of gymnasiums so okay. so yeah if these windows that you see on 108 second are not the ones that go in the existing building then they must be storing those um but i have seen them that we do have them in possession so okay. but we're just waiting because we didn't get the flashing on time it didn't make sense for us to try and do those in the evenings and be disruptive to students so we're looking for the next break period, which will be uh, uh, in, over spring break. And at Meadows, we did a painting project and we repainted the windows that we are not replacing. Um, and those are kind of around the sides and around the back. And those are a dark gray. The ones that were left green up front, those are the ones being pulled and replaced. We saw no need to obviously paint those since we were going to be replacing them. So, yeah. Well, is there any concern about theft or graffiti of some of those supplies that are kind of sitting out there. Um, yes, and they're behind the security fence and the contract okay. is taking Perfect. steps to secure them. Um, I just drove by and saw them and I was like, I wonder what's going on. I appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> we, have, we have had some theft and, and uh, vandalism at, at each of the job sites uh, to varying levels. And it's one of the things the contractors are being very diligent about. Um, but we have had uh over pleasant valley a couple weeks ago they had the batteries removed from their lists and so that slowed down things on monday because then they had to go get replacement batteries and get those put in so so uh so you know those things happen and uh, uh fortunately those windows are quite large it would be very difficult for somebody to sort of cart those out from um, sure. like hoisting them over the fence but <laughs> um but yeah that is that is something that we are uh constantly um monitoring it's uh we just had some uh, holes cut in some fencing over Park Lane recently. And so we've got some temp fence panels over there to try and um, curb that act activity. So it, well, it does you. happen. Yeah, yeah, thank you so much. And thank you to your teams. <laughs> and I see uh, Bond Oversight Committee Chair Rod was able to join us there partially through. Welcome, Rod. And thanks for being here this evening. You're on mute, Rod. There you go. There you go. No, no, it shows off mute, but I still don't have any volume. I'm not sure if you have a microphone maybe plugged in or headsets. It's picking up instead of your computer. Nope, we can. We can see you're trying to, to talk to us, but I can't hear you. Do you want to try and log off and log back in? Sometimes Zoom does that to us, unfortunately. 
Also, uh, on your mute button, there's a little arrow, and if you click on that little arrow, you can see different selections for your microphone and speaker. I don't know what settings you have. Do you want to, um, either you can log off and log on, or you can call me, and then I can just have you on the phone and put you in my speaker here. I don't know if that could work. Thank you all for your patience. And hopefully he'll be able to join us again here in just a moment. So Rod is the uh, Bond Oversight Committee Chair has done a, a superb job of advocating for the Centennial community, for Centennial uh, students and it's been a great part of all the work that's been going on. So really look forward to what he has to share from a community perspective about the wonderful bond work that we've been able to do uh, accomplish in the district, thanks to the generosity of the, uh, the voters for passing the 2020 capital improvement bond. Scott, on the gym projects, did you speak to when the control units are due to come in? I'm sorry, the control units, meaning like the, the, the big power units that are. Oh, yes. Yeah, the power units right now are the last I'd heard was that they were arriving sometime in May. Um, might push to early June, but uh, but ideally, yes, we get them all in place or we get them all in possession and then we will identify or schedule a one week time frame during the summer by which we'll change out the old switch gear and change in the new. They've already ran a lot of the. Uh, the conduit and the wiring and everything that's necessary to make the transition. Uh, but we will be firing up each of those gymnasiums well ahead of the summer with the temporary power, just so that we can use the gyms in, in the manner that, that we want to. And Chair Solowski, I'm not sure if, um, if we adopted the agenda with flexibility. Do we want to consider moving on to another report and come back to Rod when he's able to connect? Yeah, I think that's great. Um, we can keep an eye out for him and uh, maybe move on to strategic planning. Sounds great. We've got Lauren Klafke in the gallery. So, Missy, if you'll go ahead and promote uh, Lauren, then we can move on to that report. All right, so um, we've had uh, quite a bit of activity with strategic planning um, since we've come back from winter break. And so Lauren has been doing a lot of facilitation, um, both on site and more recently virtually. I'll go ahead and pass it over to Director of Curriculum and Student Learning, uh, Mo Callahan, to um, introduce Lauren and see if Mo has any uh, initial comments before we get squared away here. Thank you, James. Uh, I think most of you have met Lauren Klafke. She uh, either in uh, strategic planning or here. Um, she has been doing a phenomenal job really uh, facilitating our process for us to put uh, the strategic plan together. So um, without further ado, I'm going to pass it off to, to Lauren. Nice to see you, Lauren. Hi, good evening, everyone. Um, thanks for having me. I'm glad to see you all. Um, I have a short uh, presentation just to kind of update you and orient you to where we are in the strategic planning process. And I really want to thank, um, we have several board members who have been um, coming to many meetings, um, as well as community forums um, and different events, and your engagement has been really crucial to the process, and I appreciate um, your, your continued commitment. Uh, so I will go ahead and share this slide um, deck was shared with you. So you have a copy of it. If there are questions that um, come up, I might have snuck in a slide just to update from last night because we had a meeting. 
So this is our planning calendar. Um, as you can see, we are starting to kind of cross that threshold of um, getting towards our final meetings with our planning teams. Um, we have uh, two more core planning team meetings scheduled. They're highlighted in yellow because we actually added an additional core planning team that's going to be on February 9th. Um, and we did this to make sure we had enough time um, to really uh, both draft and get all of the ideas from the team as well as come back um, to bring in and um, have the core planning team integrate the feedback from all of the other teams um, before we bring the plan back um, to the board on March 8th. Uh, so you'll see the, the different folks, um, the different teams configurations here that are coming up. Um, I wanna just kind of give you an update of where we are in terms of the process. And um, we have um, drafted and have gener started to generate the material for um, the, the big bulk of um, student learning. Um, student learning is the primary new work for the district was around drafting a portrait of a graduate and then goals and measures for student success. Um, the mission and vision, um, that's gonna be continued and kept um, from previous years. Um, and then the performance benchmarks and those metrics will be set in um, collaboration with um, uh, Director Callahan um, and in alignment with kind of, and the superintendent in alignment with annual pr um, progress metrics for that. But that happens after plan approval, usually once we know for sure that what we're gonna focus on measuring. Um, our instructional effectiveness um, component, which is all about teaching and learning and identifying the practices and um, how we're gonna be supporting and developing um, effective educators across our system um, is well underway. Our instructional focus team um, began drafting the professional practices for effective instruction. They've completed a reflection on the um, strengthening the academic program. Um, and we have our draft of the revised four pillars, otherwise known in previous versions of the, the plan as the district priorities. Uh, and we have moved into thinking about what are all of the st strategies um, and key actions that we need to take over the course of the plan to ensure that we both support the instructional effectiveness and student learning. So we're just at the beginning part of that. All of these are shaded yellow um, at this point. The goals is a it has a blue has a has a green on it because it has received some feedback, um, but we are still in the process of our community forum of get, gathering input and feedback. And once these are revised to be shared out for a final round of feedback, um, we we shade them green just kind of keep ourselves on track to know what's been drafted. So these are all slides you've seen before. There's not an update yet. We won't have a revision on this until um, after the final community forum, which is next week. Um, so the portrait of a graduate will be updated um, and will be um, revised by the core planning team based on all the feedback that's gathered. And then it will be shared back with a larger community, um, in particular with across the campuses and departments. Um, we do have our draft of the five goals for the district. Um, goal number one is focus on ensuring that you're supporting all of your learners as they're coming into the Centennial School District by building a strong foundation, K-3. Your goal number two is focused is really we'll think about this as your social emotional learning goal and connection goal. It's all about well being and inclusivity and ensuring that students are well and feeling included and connected to school. Goal three um, is focused on student empowerment, voice and leadership. Um, this was a goal that was spoken to very passionately and articulately by your, um, the students in your system who really want to feel like they have a voice and can be change makers in the system. And I commend the core planning team for lifting up this as a, as a focus. Goal four is really focusing on how are we ensuring that all students have equitable access to high quality academics. And goal five is ensuring that all students are prepared for success in an evolving world. And so for each of those um, goals, this is kind of, we're in a drafting phase. So we have some measures. These will all be refined and revised um, by the next time you see them um, with real clear, they're still kind of in a, um, a drafty language. They will be consistent in terms of percentage and growth and you know increase and decreases and so on and so forth for each of these. But the key part about your measures is you wanna have ideally no more than 10 
maybe 12 max that because these are what will eventually become the things that we encourage you to be monitoring and focusing in on each year to ensure that you're making progress towards these goals. Okay. Um, so those are that's circle number one, your four pillars. Uh, we suggest that your four pillars are really like the foundation of the, your educational house. They're not something that you're going to redo every strategic plan. There's something that you're putting solidly in place and continuing to build on for the future uh, generations of strategic plans. So the first pillar is on teaching and focus on teaching and learning. The second pillar centers on recognizing that schools can't do this work alone. We must work in partnership with families, communities, and even students. Um, we must be focused as well on investing in people. And the people in this pillar are the people who are in the system. They're, the, they're all of the employees within the system who are supporting the work. And the last full um, pillar is thinking about what is your organizing structure? Like, what are, how are you bringing all of the components together, including things like all the bond work um, and student like learning and outcomes. So just like a, kind of like, what is your what is your whole way of making the system work well together? And so we suggest uh, that you must have for your four pillars, kind of one that's really focused on each of these areas. And so this is the slide I shared, which was kind of our um, you know, kind of middle thinking of the pillars. And then last night um, we arrived at the first full draft of the four pillars. Um, and this literally hot off the press from last night. So um, it, it's uh, pillar A, um, the core planning team has proposed that it should be focused on culturally responded student standard can't speak, sorry, student-centered teaching and learning, um, that all students will have equitable access to culturally sustaining and responsive rigorous instruction and learning, and instruction is aimed at con continuous growth and achievement for all students. Pillar B is focused on um, collaborative community, that the home school community partnership is developed through uh, building trust, seeking understanding, and promoting open dialogue to strengthen student success and well-being. They liked investing in people, so um, they, they decided to stick with investing in people as Pillar C. Um, and Pillar C is working in inclusive and supportive communities while continuously developing and supporting high quality educators. And Pillar D is ensuring holistic systems of excellence. They did not get to the point of really drafting it. So there are just some words there that are gonna be kind of still worked into a description. This is the first draft. and. Um, I really will invite when we close, I can come back to the slide. If you have questions, thoughts, comments, it's good to hear um, any board kind of, you know, thoughts and reactions to seeing this new material on the screen. Um, I will come back to that. So where are we going? So our upcoming milestones, I just put one in red because it's changed from the slide. Um, the core planning team, uh, draft drafts, my apologies. That's what happened when I edit on the fly. I'm going to fix that right like that. Thank you. I love Google Slides. Um, drafts pillars, um, and they did that last night and they were beginning the strategy uh, brainstorm. Very cursory beginning of just sharing ideas. There's a lot more that we're gonna be bringing into it in terms of some resources to be um, looking at uh, to help inform that process. We have our community forum next week, uh, as well as our instructional focus team, which is gonna finish uh, revising and working on the professional practices. And they will have their chance to provide input on the strategy maps, your strategic priorities and key actions. Um, this is a date range. It probably is gonna be more to the, the end of the range when this is open, but we will be doing a staff feedback and input on the plan itself, um, just so they have a chance to respond. The date range isn't quite set yet. so but to respond to um, the goals, the measures, the pillars, just to get some broad-based um, uh, engagement across the community. Um, we have admin team coming up uh, to provide more input and feedback on the plan. And then the core planning team is gonna have a nice job um, of really flexing their muscles and all their roles on the ninth because they will be both integrating the feedback to revise the profile goals and measures. And then they will be taking and also working on the strategy map for the strategic priorities and key actions. Um, so that is uh, all that work will then come, we'll have the IFT as well. We'll be taking a look at um, a piece. So then that will have our first kind of full draft of the plan that will still need some refinement for sure. Um, so, but we wanna bring it to you. You'll get to see kind of all of the components laid out. 
um, in, in a presentation form. And then um, any feedback that you have is gonna be coming back to um, the cabinet and also to the core planning team to kind of integrate and revise. Um, and currently the plan is to continue to hold the, the March date for the board to kind of, I don't know if it's a vote or if it's a review of the plan or what it is, I might've misspoken my nomenclature there, but um, to see the um, kind of a first read of the full plan. Um, it is a lot in the next um, while, but we want to make sure that we are um, pulling everything together in line with the ODE requirements in terms of their timeline. And if, um, and I know that Director Callahan can speak more to that. Um, I did just wanna give you kind of a sense of like what the example of a strategy map is briefly. This is just an example, not an exemplar from a district. This is from um, Washington Unified School District in West Sacramento. They had defined their pillars this way. So they had pillar A, B, C, and then they have basically what are our three strategic priorities? And one of the things that you're gonna notice about the strategic priorities is that they're not tied to a program they're tied to kind of what the aim is of the work of like what we're building. Now they might have key actions that are like MTSS or UDL or different kind of ways to get there, but really they're articulating what matters most in terms of what we're building as a system. And then for each pillar, right, there's a set of key actions. This is how they laid it out. They had system-wide and equity specific. Some people just do system-wide and it's all integrated. Um, but this is, you'll have a very specific action items that are become the work, right? That's sort of like the work plan for um, the district over the course of the plan. So I shared those, they're in the packet. We don't need to look and um, look at them in all that detail tonight, but I just wanted to give you, can you see this? What are you talking about strategy map? And I can't make this go forward anymore. So I'm gonna just stop sharing. I might not have another slide. Um, so I'll pause there and um, definitely open up any questions or um, Director Callahan, if I missed anything, I'm happy to answer any questions, comments. Thank you so much, Lauren. Are there any questions from the directors out there? I don't have any questions, but it, it, last night's meeting in particular was, it's really nice to see how the process evolving. You know, and how it's uh, how it's coming along. So thank you for all the efforts and work by everyone in the community, everyone in the district, all the teachers, everyone involved. It's really great to see. Thanks, Director Harding. Lauren, I was wondering if you would speak to how this work is connected to the equity audit, or the equity audit is connected to strategic plan. <laughs> how they 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 uh, update them on our conversation today. Oh, okay. All right. Yes. So um, thank you. Um, so one of the pieces um, that um, um, uh, was meeting on today uh, uh, with Dr. Katsuda was the just kind of the, the drafting the calendar for the equity audit. Um, and there have been some questions about how do these two things fall into place, especially if we're kind of wrapping this phase of strategic planning and then kind of digging into the equity audit. Um, I am happy to share, once we get the calendar, I'm sure we'll be sharing in some slides and information, but really the, what you can, the framework that I would use to think about it is we're going to be establishing the plan for the district. It has these large buckets and large foci, like foci, right? In terms of what we're doing. The information that's coming, going to come out of the equity audit has very specific action steps and items and recommendations around how to achieve the things that, we are um, putting into place. So there might be something that say, for example, there's a desire right, to create an inclusive and supportive um, classrooms across all of the schools in the district, right? So coming out of the equity audit, we're getting very clear, to, uh, you know, um, we'll have information about like, what are the suggested ways to actually do that? <laughs> like, what are the action steps that we can take to make that happen um, in schools that, um, and that have had success in schools and systems that are very much reflective of your own. So, um, so what's happening is that all of whatever we're getting early on, we're going to we're going to automatically kind of be pulling in some of the learning. We will have some initial survey results. We have um, a couple of our campuses um, may have their reports back from their instructional audit. Um, and then where it makes sense, we will kind of bring in some of the learning from that. Um, but really it's gonna feed into what are the individual site level plans 
the plans that the each of the departments will create in terms of early implementation of the strategic plan. So I think that we came up with a really good flow um, um, in our conversation and planning this out so that we'll have this kind of larger strategic vision, right, with key actions that will happen. And then through the equity audit, we're really detailing out like the granular level of what those action plans shall be. Go ahead, Thanks. Superintendent Owens. I just wanted to um, refer back to, and I don't know that you need to pull this up, Lauren, but the timeline slide had us um, concluding with a board review in early March, and we had some internal discussion around some of our needs continuing past that date relative to finishing the plan and getting the final touches accomplished, and then also the ODE timeline for submission of um, our plan, because remember, it's not just the strategic planning that we're doing, but we're also satisfying the requirements of the ODE integrated guidance. And that plan is due to the state of Oregon by the end of March. And so for us to provide the um, plan to the school board by March 8th, um, short changes about three weeks of working time that we would have to get everything finished off. And so some internal discussion was about the possibility of adding another uh, meeting in March on the 22nd or so for the board to review a more um, finite plan. Um, and then also, you know, what I expressed was just a reluctance to add meetings to the board uh, calendar once they're established. So maybe if Lauren and Mo could speak briefly to kind of where we would be at March 8th and then where that puts us relative to submission with ODE and kind of what that difference would be and really what the board would be seeing between the end of February and the March date and to make sure at this point, end of January, that there's comfortability with the board relative to what would, we would be able to provide at that time, if that makes sense. Mm, Can I uh, start us off, Lauren? Please. So uh, we are kind of in this parallel process. I am monitoring and watching and learning from the state around the requirements of the submission for the application. And, you know, we're really click checking all the boxes through this process. Um, the level of um, some of the, there's a series of 150 questions that will need to be addressed uh, for this submission. And really, we have so much information through this strategic planning process. It will be us um, uh, ciphering through the information to, to get the state the information that they need in, a, in the process that they want. But I'm not concerned about it at all in terms of the timeline. I We do need those three weeks, you know, from... Uh, March 8th on through the rest of the month in order to to draft it. Um, <clears throat> if it, you know, I don't know if you've seen ODE reports and submissions, but it's pretty dry writing and it's definitely they want it done in a certain way. So we want to make sure that we meet that criteria. Uh, the other piece that we'll be working on and one of the requirements will be to have um, long range tiered goals based on focal groups of students. And so that's a piece though that though it's required, it is optional to turn in by the 31st. Uh, Chuck Tomac, who's a consultant who's been working with me um, this year and last year, he's him and I are gonna work together and um, figure out and learn the best way to do what we need to do around those goals. But it's gonna follow what the plan is. And we're gonna, it's gonna be really clear in terms of the focal groups who we're focusing on and the access points that they need and how we monitor. So that's all kind of technical work that will be done on the back end, if that makes sense. So um, yeah, questions or add-ons maybe first, Lauren, from your perspective. Yeah, I think that what, I, what I'm aiming to have prepared or we have drafted is um, a draft of the portrait that's been revised and we've gotten feedback, a draft of the goals and measures, probably not yet most, uh, you know, speaking to like performance benchmarks where you're really saying, okay, exactly in five years, where are we going to be? And how are you having really gap closing acceleration for student groups that are not yet at you know, where we want them to be? Um, so that is going to come a little bit later. Uh, we won't, I don't think that that will be there. I, I don't think it's gonna be there on March 9th. Um, and then, 
we will also should have the draft, the full draft of your um, strategy map. So what are those strategic priorities? So if you think about what was like, what's hanging on for destination um, 2023, you have your four quadrants and these are the things, the, the key things we're doing underneath them. You'll have that information and you'll have a certain degree of detail, um, like in those last slides I showed you about those key actions that are gonna be taken to ensure to get to those priorities. Those key actions I think will evolve and over the course, I mean, through, over the course of the information gathered for the equity audit, because there may be a key action that comes up that we're like, actually, <laughs> we need to do this and we didn't realize it. And I think that it's important to um, know that like you're, um, you want to set your goals for students. We do that up front. We spend the most time there to make sure we're all oriented in the same direction. And then we, we build kind of the road, right? Our, our foundation of how, what we're gonna build on to get there. And then the rest, you know, will be drafted, but we are gonna have to do some more, kind of be a little bit more nimble with the information that we receive um, over March and April. Um, but I think everything that you would need and in talking with um, Director Southerton, I think everything you need for budgeting, what you need for to sort of like move forward in that way, it sounds like we're gonna be on track to have the key, you know, key components. And so that the board would have a real idea of like, we understand the work you're undertaking in this plan and we understand how you wanna measure it. Um, and so I think that that's, you'd walk away with that yeah. um, clarity. Yeah. And then as far as bringing it to the board for approval, I've reached out to the state to just to get clarity on to what extent is that approval in terms of, um, uh, if we're going to wait for the goals or if that's not quite ready. So we're, we're going to get clarity on that. Thanks. I just wanted to elevate that point for discussion now rather than have that come up a little bit closer to submission. Go ahead, Director Andrews. Oh, you're muted. Sorry. So sorry, folks. Um, Superintendent Owens, did you raise that because um, because you want us to be aware of those things, or are you concerned that we may come winging in from the outside and say, "Oh, this is a problem. We got to do a rework or something like that"? No, I good question. Yeah, I was actually going to add on to what Lauren said, but I feel like she said it pretty sufficiently, but I'll just kind of say what I was going to say, which is by March 8th, by early March, in essence, what the board will be approving is the framework of the plan that will have a pretty good level of detail. It will have where we're charting to go as a district, as well as goals and metrics, um, pillars and so forth. So my impression and assumption is that that would be sufficient for the board to be able to assess the course that we're taking. Um, nailing down all of the tactics, strategies, and budgets, um, which would be those additional three weeks wor worth of work. I don't know that the net board necessarily needs to weigh in on in terms of having that level of detail for an approval of the overall objectives of what we're trying to accomplish as a district. And so I appreciate you raising that point just to make sure that I'm being clear and that we're all clear that my assumption is that the board will be comfortable in early March approving the framework of the plan. And my understanding, correct me if I'm wrong, Lauren, is that that's normally what you bring forward to boards. Um, but then also just realizing that there's going to be some compliance and submission pieces that we have to finish on the other side of that um, in order to bring it to compliance with ODE and have it all finished but that we don't necessarily need to convene an additional March board meeting in order to have all of that extra level of detail before the board so that we could submit it on time and have the board review and approve those additional details in advance, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I think, I mean, in terms of, we have um, many slash most of our clients, um, the boards will, what they get is like a PowerPoint version of the plan, right? Um, maybe we'll have like a first visual representation of like the portrait or you know something that's more like outward facing but we usually are going for approval on the powerpoint and then the full plan gets completed in the next few months because part of that you know it has to do with allocation of resources as well in the budgeting conversation 
Does that address your question, Director Anders? Well, I just want to make one comment, and it has to do more with my style than anything, but uh, we've had ample opportunity to come along for the ride. So I'm assuming that um, that each of us, in our own way, will, by March 8th, be incredibly comfortable with what we've got for a product, however we gain that comfort. So I, I'm not seeing that we're going to have any issue meeting that deadline from, from the board perspective anyway, so that then the whole pro product can go together. But, but others may have a different perspective. Thank you, Director Andrews. Uh, Director Shields. I would agree with Director Andrews. And we know that it's going to be sent in. That doesn't mean that we can't, um, you know, get the copy of the report at the same time that it's being delivered. So if there were something that would be a red flag, a board member would have an opportunity to at least bring it up to our superintendent and our cabinet members who, who are overseeing it. Um, so if it's important for me to really, really look at it at just as it's gonna go into ODE, we could be afforded that opportunity and then have our questions answered if, it, if something's raised. But, just the level of experience that's on this board and the level of commitment that the board members have been making to the process says that we're well informed all the way along through our board meetings and, and you know personal you know participation. So I'm I'm comfortable with it going, but you know, getting it the day it goes in, give us this an opportunity to say, oh, you know, answer me this question. There's always those those kind of and they're usually just uh, clarifications, right? Um, and it's nice to be able to see something that the state department is going to say. One question, this is, this is the ODE's new process, right? So we're right. all in a learning curve and you, whatever we're going to be submitted is going to be um, subjected to um, maybe some editing in a way that, because they don't even know what they're looking for. They've put out a framework, but they don't know what they're going to get back. So they're going to have a lot of, um, opportunity to to say, hey, you might want to change this, or we become the standard, which I think is actually what's going to happen. We're going to be the standard for everybody else to meet. That'll be cool. Thank you, Director Shields. This is a great presentation. Are there any other questions? Kudos to everybody that's been coming. Um, I see I see the board members there. I see the district staff at like all of the different mm -hmm. meetings and the, it's a lot. Yeah. And, um, and especially thank you to Lauren for keeping us all engaged the whole way through. Um, and our community, I mean, like last night at that core planning team, it was very evident that like, there's a lot of passionate people who are really wanting to um, have their voice heard in this process. And so it's just been a wonderful process to watch it unfold and, and gain steam. So congratulations, great work. All right. Look forward to next steps. Yeah, I'll see you next week. <laughs> Take care. Bye, Lauren. Bye-bye. Um, at this point, I see Rod is with us. And so I'd love to turn it back over. I'll ask first, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, we can. Yes. Amazing. We're not sure why, but we're on the third computer now. So lucky for that. Um, hello, everybody. And especially hello to, uh, to Roger. I haven't uh, had a chance to talk with you or anything, but you are a new board member and uh, all of this is gonna come flying at you at 60 miles an hour. So <laughs> yeah, that's the way it felt when I got on the board. But uh, anyway, I'll try to make this brief, uh, but uh, informational. And uh, if I have any questions at the end, I certainly will try to, to answer them as, as we can. Um, um, I think where to start, where to start. Um, this is sort of, this is uh, being on the, uh, the BOC is one of those things that is it's sort of like everything everywhere all at once. It's all happening all around there. And that's sort of what, uh, what Scott has to, to deal with everything. Uh, it's like one building, then no, he's got to go to another building and whatnot. But uh, I think to start off with, I'm, I'm going to give him a kudo the, because uh, uh, he has shown over the over the years that I've known him, which is just a couple of years, uh, the uh, the passion that he brings to Centennial. Uh, he's not born and bred in Centennial, but he's br he's brought 
that passion to it. And when I listened to his uh, uh, um, report on bringing in the National Guard, I said, that's just one more thing that he's done for us and that it, would, it came out of left field. So I'm, I'm so appreciative of that as I'm, I'm sure that uh, some of the, uh, the, uh, the conservative spenders of money are as well. So uh, I, I, it just sounds, uh, when we do our next bond, Scott, you don't leave the area. Uh, anyway, there are- I'd like to take credit for the National Guard, but that was actually kind of a joint effort between school district folks. <laughs> okay, well, you fact, still- uh, In fact, I think Dante brought it up to us initially. <laughs> Mm -hmm. as, as a possibility so we've 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 mined that one so <laughs> that's just fine keep on mining um the the bond or i'm going to just kind of go over some of the things really quickly especially for roger so he can hear these at least once and they are on the, the prior uh years of uh, uh annual report uh, the bod bocs and the, uh, the the goals that we're trying to meet are that we're trying to ensure that there's proper usage of the bond money serves a conduit of information for the, the, um, the, the community. And, and that means that it's an active piece that uh, the, the board members and the people who are on the BOC uh, are, are needing to, to make sure that it gets out to the community to review the, pro, the, the, the bond program performance and audits, and then ensuring that the grant dollars are incorporated, uh, that grant dollars are incorporated into long and braided as, as the, I guess that's the new terminology now, is braided into the, the entire uh, bond effort. So, and that has been really great. The ESSER funds um, um, and, the, and the Austin grants and those sorts of things. We started out with $65 million. Uh, we passed the bond, it suddenly jumped to, to $72 million. And then with the grants for the seismic and everything like that, it went up to almost $80 million. So I know one of the uh, one of the uh, options was for an eighty million dollar grant or for a bond, and we've or so we're so we're sort of up there. Some of the things uh, have were very uh, uh, targeted, like for the seismic improvements, that sort of thing, or the the, the lighting in the schools uh, that that came through with uh, just a certain amount. If we spent more or less than that, or we 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 wouldn't get all the grant, or we had to spend a little of our own money. But it opened up options that. Uh, are so important to the environment the students live in and then teachers live in as well. But uh, the, there were things along the way that um, that we don't have any control over. And those are supply chain issues. That's both the timing, the unexpected delays and when they come up and the materials, whether they're gonna come in on time or not, or if we're gonna be first in line or that we're, they're gonna give uh, some preferential you know, treatment to, to others, and we're still waiting for our gym siding, for instance. But uh, And then COVID-19, we knew that when we were going into this, that we were trying to pass a bond with the beginning of, a, of an unknown uh, virus. And we said, the heck with it, we're gonna do this, we're going for it. Uh, we just missed the, the first one in two, 2018, we're gonna just really try really hard. And it, even though we knew that there were gonna be issues, the echo, of the 2020 COVID uh, scare and concern are still kind of bouncing around right now, but we're, we're it looks like we're gonna be getting that un under control uh, through the CDC and, and, the, uh, and the developing a virus that's given like the, the yearly flu viruses. Uh, site irregularities, particularly with P P uh, Powell Butte, uh, we had to take out several uh, oil, I think it was oil, that, correct me if I'm wrong, Paul, uh, um, uh, containers out of there and we're also sitting there right next to the little run water uh conduit yeah they were all septic septic tanks. Tanks. Yeah, septic septic tanks. Tanks. yeah so uh um the site of regularities we had no uh, way to to really deal with that as a as a, as a group of people that wasn't our charge inflation inflation it was up to eight percent a couple of months ago and now it's down to six something uh, but you, we can't control that and we and all we can do is hope that uh that uh, Scott can find more more things like the uh, National Guard to, <laughs> on the other end of inflation, reduce our costs that way. And so we're really looking for that to come through to us. And we want and we, we do hear these reports before everybody else does. And so we get a chance to see that and kind of comment on it at that point. But it's not really something that unless we're concerned about not if we can have a contingency, we'd be really concerned <laughs> about uh, things like uh, inflation. And, and and things that come up that were unwarranted uh, for what we had to do and labor shortages as well. 
So we sometimes we don't get people to be able to come in because just some people are just not coming back to work and, and working in, in construction at this point. And so we can't keep up with a, a schedule. So we all know that scheduling means that either you, you start uh, working people from four to 12 uh, there, or you just have to extend your, your timelines that way, which continues to add costs to that though. So, but we're still not, we don't, we don't ask, well, why is that, why is that happening, Scott? Or why is that happening, Paul? It's just those environmental uh, things that the, that the, that our committee cannot really address uh, with, with a direct purpose, maybe indirect, but, but certainly not direct. Um, we have, um, let me see what else I have written down here. Uh, that's all done. I think um, the overarching goals of, of, of the, uh, and I guess, uh, but I, I listened to Scott when he was making his, as, the, as you guys were, uh, uh, we were trying to get our end uh, cleared up. Uh, Scott made all the comments about uh, the gymnasiums um, um, and Harold Oliver becoming the second, that's an amazing uh, thing that we had gotten that ready already. And I really appreciate the, the work that, uh, that Paul is working to, to make happen and Scott is making working to make happen. It's in it's in the north end of our district. And I want I really, really wanted to make sure that we serviced that's that end of the district uh, to, to make sure that there's no no lapse in uh, any kind of uh, um, teaching processes, particularly since we went from to, to a six to six eight uh, system of middle school and from a seven eight was it, and that was just great. I'm just great that that happened. Um, so I'm going to let I'm going to let those lay. Those are things that we looked at. We had our conversations with. Uh, we didn't. It was really kind of a quiet year. I'd have to say. I'd say that it was a year in which uh, we were in we were in our flow. The flow of of everything that had happened in the first part of the year had gotten into a place where like 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 a, like a race. In the middle of your race, you are you're in your element. You've got your pace. You've got your stride. You've got your Kind of your your plans are set up, but you don't you're not making the run for the finish yet. In 2023, I think that we will be at the working working around the end of the of the race, and I think that we'll have lots more questions and a lot more things to talk about during the third year of this. Um, I, I do want to say that, uh, and I'm going to just say a couple of other things. Um, we are going to check be checking. I think uh, the list. The, the to-do list against the available monies that we have left. So that'll be really important for us to be keep looking at. So I'm going to tell Scott and, and Paul that now, because uh, we'll be that'll be coming up there, and they need to kind of address that as we go along. And it's and in in the and specifically about the the four million dollar contingency, uh, we need to find out when it's going to be safe to use the contingencies. And at what pace will we be using those contingencies? And how will it fit in with the, the bond monies, the awesome monies, the ESSER monies, those sorts of things so we can leverage what we can and finish, the, finish the, um, that particular new section of, of the budget, the $4 million section. So that'll be coming up uh, and we'll be, because it's, it's like landing plane. And I talked to Paul about this earlier. We want to end up in the airport with no fuel left over and a nice landing. <laughs> we don't want to overshoot the airport because that plane is going to go away for five years and we're going to get back on it in five years and we're going to have another bond coming up then. So we want to be we want gasless at the end. We want to get right there. So I want to, and I, I want to help um, um, Roger with, with a little bit of the thing is that the overarching goals uh, that we have are to establish a centennial BOC way that works. So along the way, we're trying to modify what we do to find out whether or not that works or doesn't work. And so that when we do it again in 20, 2028, we'll have some pathway that we need to follow. Uh, my pathway is to let everyone talk whenever they want to talk uh, about anything they want to talk about. And then we will we'll, we'll filter it all past that and we'll, we'll come up with, the, with, the, uh, with what we need to do uh, for that. The, we need to, pr um, we need to prove to the community that their dollars have been appropriately spent. That's the second overarching thing that we have. And that's all because we want to springboard the current bond successes to pass the 2028 bond with a zero tax increase. 
So those are the overarching, the things that you don't necessarily write down in the bond uh, description, but it is certainly things that we are looking for. So we wanted to be 100% right all of the time and be fiduciarily um, accurate and loyal to the, the, the expense of the, of the tax dollars. I know I pay, we pay lots of taxes on our house and it all goes, a bunch of it goes to Centennial. So I, I know you're doing the right thing with the money <laughs> because it's coming out of my pocket too. So anyway. Thank um, you so much, Rod. You've done such a wonderful job kind of pulling this all together for us. Well, I needed, I had to have the help of, of I, I did work originally with uh, uh, somebody from uh, the, I think the assistant principal from um, from Gresham Barlow when they did their big, I guess it was was it was it two hundred million? I think it was two hundred million. And uh, they, I, I did, I got the impression that they didn't really have much of a of a DOC uh, effort in that process. But I got information back from Scott uh, about uh, other things that he had done, and Rick, his his partner uh, Yao. Uh, gave me some good uh, information, so I, I built from that. I, but just knowing me, I'm very, I'm a very accurate person, and I'm a very honest person. And I wanted to make sure that honesty is built from transparency. And so it has to be open, it has to be visible, it has to be, you know, accurate. So that's how I built that uh, that process. Awesome. Well, thank you very much, Paul. Was there anything you wanted to add? No, I just uh, I want to extend your gratitude to Rod and the other members of the BOC. So we, yes. early to the board, we have uh, seven active members uh, that are non-Centennial um, employees on the BOC, devoting their time, dedicating their time, volunteering their time to um, advocates for the community uh, that we're doing a great job with the bond and keeping our promises. And then also they're a conduit to bringing back information about the bond work to the community. So just really appreciate the Bond Oversight Committee. Uh, members. So thank you, Chair Solowski, and thank you, Todd. Thank you for bringing that back in. I was going to say something, and also wanted to thank uh, Claudia Andrews' uh, uh, work on the board, too. She, uh, as, as you will remember, in the swimming pool area, uh, asked about the adaptive, uh, 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 um, well, I don't know if it, was a, if it was a way to get in the pool or whatnot, but that was, uh, it had been forgotten a little bit. So but everyone is thinking, that's what I'm thinking. It's just everyone is thinking about what, what they know about. Everyone brings a different set of, of eyes and a different set of skill sets to this process. We're not all accountants. I, I guarantee you, I tried going to college. Thank you, Rod. Appreciate Thank that. You. Thank you very much. Awesome. Um, at this point, it looks like we have a... Um, Oh, where's my agenda? Come back here. Uh, report. Oh, from Dr. Er, for Director Callahan is up next. Thank you. Good evening again, Board of Directors. So I am happy to present a report on our district music, arts, and theater programs. Uh, this being my second year, I really hadn't had a chance to, to dig into this. So this was a, a pleasurable task for me. So uh, we'll... we'll um, take you through some of the staffing and program uh, things that we're doing. So first, uh, this is a the staffing, K-12 uh, for music, art, uh, theater. You can see our elementary, um, primarily music. They get their art um, in theater in the classroom where that shows Hello. up. Yeah. Sorry to interrupt, you're, um, you're not displaying. It sounds like we're supposed to be seeing something. Oh, thank you, thank you. I guess I forgot to share my screen. So thanks, Paul. All right, let's try that again. Here we go. Okay, uh, this is the slide of our current staff for music, arts, and theater uh, cut across elementary, our two middle schools, and our high school, along with the FTE. Uh, we'll start with music and our uh, and specifically elementary. Um, elementary, uh, our music programs are definitely a highlight of each of our elementary school communities throughout the year. Uh, in elementary, we're uh, as a principal shared with me, we are growing students as mathematicians through song, play, and dance. Uh, we utilize various instruments like the ORF, uh, recorders, ukuleles various instrument, uh, uh, 
various instruments also includes drums, sorry, uh, SEL, and then an also is included along with uh, just really increased focus on being culturally responsive. Um, elementary schools get music twice a week, about 25 minutes. Um, and they are, each building is planning on uh, at least one program, if not more. And some of that is really dependent on, we've got some uh, new educators who are still just getting their legs under them and building their music program. But um, I would anticipate to see more of that in the future. For middle school, um, let's see here, we're returning to a year long choir and hoping to connect our middle school, this is for Centennial, hoping to correct, uh, connect our middle school curriculum and build upon our elementary experiences in the future. So that's one of the goals I know that Nathan has for, uh, for music in Centennial. And as far as Oliver Middle School goes, the goal is to build a music program from the ground up. This year, uh, Oliver Middle School has two exploratory music classes as an elective, and uh, that seems to be getting kids excited about music. For high school, um, we have more opportunities for students interested in music, uh, with the main goal this year is to rebuild both band and choir with the goal of students continuing through those programs for four years. So it's, it's uh, exciting to hear uh, our principals really get behind uh, the music and the arts. So I wanna to move to, to art. Um, the following slides are really focused on secondary uh, art. Um, as I mentioned earlier, a lot of that happens uh, in the elementary classroom, dependent on the, the elementary teacher and the, the grades. Uh, but these are all art projects from our Centennial students. Um, <clears throat> we'll start with the middle school. And let's see here, where am I at here? Each middle school is capitalizing on staff expertise to well, also wanting to meet student interests. So they're really blending what is what are students asking for and where's the expertise in the building and and standing up some some programs. And that's why you see uh, Oliver Middle School is doing craft graphic design and Centennial Middle School is doing year-long art. Um, so there, there's some variance there. Oh, uh, let's see here. And then high school, um, I actually added the notes right on this, the screen here, but uh, they're looking at possibly a fine arts assembly event at Centennial Middle School prior to forecasting to help there. Uh, also looking at potentially an art show at the end of May, and uh, to keep building on the sculpture, sculpture program, which is uh, fun to, to read, especially after, you know, I know Centennial Middle School's hoping to get a kiln next year. Uh, Centennial Virtual Academy. So they also, uh, they have high school students participating in music and arts classes, and you can see the classes that they uh, <clears throat> taken advantage of. Um, and then uh, Zach also shared me shared with me one of the more popular classes for K-5 is a basic arts class where CVA students, uh, CVA has partnered with uh, schoolhouse supplies who are providing art supplies. So some really cool things happening there. Uh, moving to, to theater, <clears throat> again, focus at primary or at secondary, even though that is a primary stage. Um, middle school theater, uh, we've got, again, uh, electives happening at Centennial Middle School uh, for after school, uh, pr an after school production. And then Oliver Middle School is doing a film and literature class. Very similar to the arts, you know, where's the interest of the kids and then where's the expertise in the building and how do we build that in? Uh, and then for theater at the high school, you can see we've got about 60 to 70 students participating. We've got a number of uh, events uh, that are happening through, through the year. Uh, we had a successful fall production. And the theater goal for this year is to have enough students audition to, uh, to produce a, uh oh, hold on a second. Um, ah, sorry. My screen is 
a full scale musical again. Sorry about that. Um, so uh, that really is our music arts and theater um, program update. I'm happy to take any questions that you might have. Thank you so much, Director Callahan. I know that um, for my student, the intro to theater uh, elective at the middle school was a favorite class. Um, so it's really great to see us including those. Um, do we have a dark room at the high school? Like is photography even still a thing? Like real photography? Um, no, not a dark room because we've switched all to digital. But if you come, especially first period, you'll see students everywhere with cameras taking pictures. It's pretty outstanding some of the work that they've been able to produce. Awesome. Nice. Thank there you. was a dark room when I was in high school there. <laughs> not there anymore. Yeah. Change of the times. Uh, Dr. Director Shields. I'd like to kind of go back to some basic questions about um, impact. So if we have three different areas that we're talking about, music, arts, and theater, I need to be educated as to what um, research says in terms of impact. I, I would, these are my assumptions and that you would maybe need to help correct me on. But my assumption would be music, arts and theater are ways to engage students and other things that are seen as different than straight academics, not better or worse than, just different than a math class, a social science class, you know, reading, writing, math, that kind of thing. All right, so if that's something we can agree on, that is an enhancement to the academic programs, my also understanding is that there are some things um, that do enhance the other academics. You know, what is the research as it relates to music education and achievement in the areas of mathematics as, as an example? Because if we are going to have to look at adding back as we can with budget, then my personal bias would be adding back those things that would also enhance uh, the students in their academic pursuits. Going to the elementary, um, we saw that there's, there's choral, you know, there's music, right? The definition of music, I'm not sure what that means, but from looking at the list, it's not banned. Uh, it might have a few instruments, but it's not like a band program, which we used to have way back in the day. And I'm not sure if there's a correlation between band education and enhancing the academics, but I know that there's a dang good correlation between band in elementary when it comes to band participation at the middle school. Mm -hmm. So that's another thing that I would want to know a little bit, a little bit more about, again, enhancing academics. And lastly, we can't be the only district that's, that is uh, challenged by money <laughs> and knowing where to put it and keeping these kind of activities, which we know engage our students and we know can enhance the academics and we know can enhance their participation. We have a Center for Advanced Learning called, you know, we act, the acronym of PAL. It, but it's been focused on labs and sciences and things of that nature. I don't know that we have to continue to have that thought process as it relates to that facility, et cetera. What could we might explore with our district partner, you know, other districts, Gresham Barlow, um, maybe Park Rose, Reynolds, whatever, those people that have been involved in the Cal process um, previous years or even now, to say, what about advanced band? What about marching? What about the kinds of things that we used to do? Can we be creative in our way of talking with our other districts? And I'm not talking about it, something that's going to happen this year, but if we start planting the seeds so that we can move our monies, let's move our monies as further down as possible to help our students, uh, you know, really get a solid music education through band and, and uh, choral music, instrumental, if you will. And then have that opportunity for that more advanced, maybe in that Cal environment, but start spreading that um, idea and see that what we could do in terms of combining resources with other districts, mm -hmm. because we are all suffering from the lack of being able to offer 
uh, robust programs in these areas. Now, I focused on, my, on the music part of it. You will have to educate me better on how arts and arts education enhances academics and then how um, theater and theater arts education also enhances academics. There, might, there may be a lot of research out there. I just don't, I'm just a little bit more aware of music education mm -hmm. and um, instrumental uh, performance. So not opposed to the others, just lacking basic research and information to help me. If I had to come down to where budgeting and where we would put the money, I would like to have us as board members on an even playing field as to what we understand about the impact of dollars mm -hmm. in these three areas. Mm -hmm. So thank you for listening. That was a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Did you want me to take a crack at that? <laughs> <laughs> I, I could tell you that the, there is research and really it is related to all three. Um, and if you, you know, if you dive into the brain reach research in particular, you know, music, are using your hands, connecting the head with your heart, hands and your heart and, and getting into those arts, do you get, it goes beyond a well-rounded education. It certainly does well round out, it, you know, rounds out folks in terms of their learning, but it does much more, more than that. Um, I would have to do more research with the art and the theater myself, but I know through my knowledge of brain research that it does impact academics. You have increased graduation rates. You have uh, increased academic success. Uh, you have the so soft skills developing. You have uh, social emotional development, uh, relational development in in those settings. So it absolutely does uh, impact uh, academics. And I would say specifically as a math teacher, um, and having. Uh, worked with adult learners around mathematics that uh, fascinating to hear adult um, learners of mathematics when they talk about being a musician because the, the patterning that they pick up, for example, through music is uh, really, there's a tight link between mathematical thinking, critical thinking, and music, that, that I know. Um, so, yeah, so all of your, uh, it sounds like, you know, pres some presumptions there, you're, you're, you're right on in terms of that. Um, and it is the first thing, you know, my experience being in, in Oregon for 30 years is it does tend to be one of the first things to go. And so, you know, I haven't been in a district that hasn't uh, struggled with music, arts, and theater in this state. Um, and my hat's off to our principals. Is you know, I'll, I I reached out and asked the question, "What are you focused on around music, arts, and theaters?" And every one of them have goals and aspirations for us to to want to to grow that. I know I didn't address all your questions, but I wrote down quant like the cow. I'm real curious about that. I'm gonna uh, pick Zach's brain on that. Great, uh, Director Andrews, and then Director Hardin. Um, so, yeah, I agree with everything that Vice Chair Shields said, but I want to go in a little bit of a different direction, as I think many of us and maybe all of us know there's going to be a marching band reunion in June, and those folks are interested in helping the district, possibly even financially, resume a marching band program. And we need to be prepared as a district to help figure that out and how that could help and how have some ideas. I think Principal Miller probably already has them of how we could apply money that might come from people or volunteers or you know how we would do that. I'd also like to ask, and I, I, I'm gonna just say, I am really pleased to see the student involvement at the middle school. Mm -hmm. And I understand that the student involvement at the high school is really related to the outcome from the pandemic. And it, it really saddens me and I'm not sure how we can get that to change until the middle schoolers 
at both Centennial and Oliver start moving into the high school and have the, the background there. But anyway, I would like to know what do the kids want? Are the kids interested in resuming a marching band program? And so that we can uh, approach these people and say, well, you know, marching isn't what they want to do necessarily. Maybe they do. Maybe, maybe the Centennial Middle School and Oliver Middle School are going to put together a band and do some marching and parades and stuff this spring. That would be so cool if they would do that. Um, however, here's another suggestion, and I think there's probably lots of other options out there. Um, mariachi bands are a big deal in middle schools and high schools throughout the country. I think that would be so cool to be, have mariachi band. I mean, what an attractant to the district, you know, for, for people who have, I mean, it was all, marching band attracted families to the district. And um, anyway, that's why I'd like to know what the kids want to do. What, what kind of the, the musically inclined kids in the middle school and in the high school as well. Let, let's be prepared to have them have their voices heard with this group at the reunion in June. Thank you. Thank you, Director Anders. Um, uh, Principal Miller, do you have, not to put you on the spot, but I'm just curious. I mean, you heard what Director Andrews had to say. I imagine that generated some thoughts for you. I'm curious what you have. Yeah, um, just for your own knowledge, through our forecasting, one of the things we always offer out is band and the um, different components such as marching band. As you know, Bree, our band director, is working very hard and we're trying to support her in building the programs. And I appreciate the board because, and then also superintendent, because the FTE allotment as we're rebuilding the program has been very helpful this year. And she has plans to continue it, um, continue to grow it. Um, Bringing back a marching band, um, if there's enough interest, is something we're very interested in, um, especially because it supports all the other programs like sports and athletics, you know, out on the field. Um, there is the equipment, but it's the student interest at this point more than anything else. And there, up until this point, it'll be interesting to see folk forecasting um, this coming year, but the interest has not been there to have enough um, people on the field to make it really fun to have the marching band. And this comes from, I used to play mellophone. So trust me, I totally get it. I, you know, went down to U of O myself. So marching bands in my blood, but um, we're at some, we're definitely in the regrowing phase. Thank you. Director Harden. Uh, yeah, just a couple of thoughts that are, um, I'm curious. I don't need answers tonight by any means, but you know, looking at the FTE, I'm curious how that compares to when we did have a successful band program. And if we're, you know, I understand like if we only have so many resources and, you know, maybe it's a different allocation of priorities, um, but I don't know if the two are directly correlated either. You know, if it's the same FTE, then just hiring more staff for it isn't a, wouldn't be a solution. Uh, for bringing it back. And like Principal Miller just said, you know, student interest is a huge part of it too. Um, I have a hard time thinking they don't want to play music and do art and, you know, act uh, and put together some, some plays, um, you know, in one of those areas. But I would like, uh, you know, I'm just curious how uh, the difference between now and then, you know, in the previous generations, how they would compare and if uh, it's a prioritization of funding for would lead to success or set us up for success, or if it's, yeah. you know, we're just looking for more student involvement and need other ways to engage the students versus just hiring more staff. Yeah. We'll do some research on uh, historical FTE and get back to you on that because you raise a good point. Yeah. I would, um, I thank you so much, Director Callahan, for this report. I think that um, arts education in all forms is fundamental in education and that um, the more students that we can get involved in the arts, the more we'll see empathy and other things come out of it that are really going to make our community shine. 
Um, my one last question that I did have is, is there funding set aside for field trips to go to art museums, special exhibits at, at things, um, theatrical events? I think that um, it's wonderful to have the FTE and the teachers there, but sometimes it does so much uh, inspirationally to see things um, that other folks have done. Mm. That, that's a good question um, in terms of the funding. I'm not sure what, what buildings have. I'd have to look into that. Uh, we have a, a pretty limited um, budget for repairs, maintenance, um, and equip, you know, uh, materials. Um, but like last year, we were able to use some of the SIA funds and we were really, we were able to enhance uh, the, the music, the arts and the theater at secondary. Yeah. So, uh, but that's a good question. It's been really great. And I, I, I wonder too, if there aren't um, some type of grants or pro programs or partnerships that we could develop with like the Portland Art Museum. Um, I'm sure that there's lots of little uh, art exhibits around that would love to um, bring more youth into their spaces to create the next generation of artists as well. Yes, yes. And we do have a, a partnership with uh, Regional Arts Council, yep. which is no longer called that. I think it's AEAF. I forget what it stands for. <laughs> Arts Education Something Something Foundation. But uh, what, what those um, dollars fund are half of our elementary music teachers. But that might be a resource for us to reach out to to see because I think I get the sense they're in transition a little bit. Yeah. Um, so there might be some potential there. Great. Uh, Director Shields, one last comment and then we'll move on. Um, your comment, um, Chair Slusky, reminded me of the fact that we are in the city of Portland and there is an arts fund. And we were bypassed at one time or kind of mm. we had to go after it or we had to look for it mm. um, because sometimes it's forgotten that we're part of the city of Portland as well as Russia. So again, when, we, when we're asking through the budgeting process to you know, create maybe some nuances, right? Mm -hmm. And there's that, these blocks of money um, that we, yeah, I know we use the general fund to help us fund our overall programs, but if we find that something is significant and important and field trips raise, you know, get to that for because of exposure to and students having an understanding of, mm -hmm. do we use things like the arts fund that's supposed to be coming from this you know, other source? You know, that, you know, it's just marked for those kinds of activities. Um, that might give heartburn to our um, business operations area because it means a singular fund that has to be monitored rather than, you know, can we find the resources within the larger budget? But and in fact, he happened to unmute as you were saying that. <laughs> yeah, so we um, we absolutely do receive that funding right now and we do use it for arts programs. If we wanted to call it out and separate it out for, you know, the instructional staff, and separate out specifically, we could call that out um, as a separate special revenue fund. So it would be in the 200 level instead of the 100 level of the budget. Um, there wouldn't there just wouldn't be additional funds. That would be just, you know, changing the way it's presented in the budget, essentially. Right. Uh, now, if um, Director Callahan, who's in charge of student learning and uh, curriculum, you know, along with others, uh, want to explore opportunities to utilize those funds in a different way, that's an entirely different subject. But we're, we do receive that support. We're grateful for that support. It's almost $600,000 a year if people were interested in what the district receives. And so that absolutely helps us provide uh, more programming than we could without it. So just wanted to offer that into the space. Thank you so much. Um, all of this is near and dear to my heart. Um, and so I just really appreciate all the intention and thoughtfulness that went into the report. And I look forward to seeing what we can do as a district to increase opportunities for our students. So thank you very much.
Um, at this point, let's turn it over to Director or Superintendent Owens for his report. All right. You think you can hang in for this one more? I'm going to keep it quick. Okay, let's do it. All right. So as I said, knowing that we've had several reports this evening, I intend to keep this pretty short. Uh, first, although we're virtual this evening, you might have noticed, noticed that I am not in my usual Zoom location. That's because I'm attending the Oregon Association of School Executives Conference at Glen Eden Beach um, on the coast. This afternoon, I attended a new Superintendent Academy meeting geared towards superintendents in their first and second year. Uh, we learned about bond basics from Carol Samuels, who is the managing director with Piper Samuel, uh, Sandler, who specializes in public finance. Tomorrow, I plan to meet with East County superintendents in the morning, then hear Oregon Deputy Superintendent of Public Instruction Colt Gill speak, as well as Nancy Hungerford, who is one of Centennial's legal counsel, as well as several other districts around the state. Following that, there will be a statewide superintendent meeting, and the following day, there will be uh, breakout sessions on various topics of interest related to school district leadership. Uh, knowing that we had a strategic plan update earlier, I'll make comments here relatively brief, but I wanted to touch on a couple of strategic planning related events. Last evening, the core planning team for strategic planning uh, convened virtually. As a reminder, the core planning team shepherds the process from beginning to end. Um, at the meeting, the group spent time further establishing the four pillars of the plan, as well as the description for each of these pillars. Um, the group also began brainstorming strategies aligned with both the pillars and then the previously drafted goal areas. The second strategic planning uh, family and community forum is coming up soon. It will be Monday, January 30th from 6 to 730. That's this upcoming Monday. Participants are asked to register virtually to receive, receive the Zoom link for the meeting. Um, we've been advertising the forum in a number of different ways, both at the school and also at the district level. And I would encourage you to spread the word so that we can collect as much information as possible to help inform our plan. Next week, we'll be busy regarding strategic planning uh, beyond the family and community forum on Monday. We will also have the instructional focus team meeting on Tuesday, and then the third and final alignment team meeting with the community partners on Thursday. Uh, finally, I wanted to let the board know that Chief Communications Officer Albert Rosales Correa is currently working with District Athletic Director Dante Gouge to plan a grand opening or reopening of the Centennial High School pool. Um, quite a bit of investment went into upgrading the facility, and we look forward to showcasing everything that was done. Um, so look for a date for the event to be shared with you sometime shortly. I invite any questions or comments you might have about any of these topics. And that concludes my superintendent's report. Thank you, Superintendent Owens. Quick question, will it be a pool party? <laughs> you betcha. Okay, um, Director Shields. Well, I'll make sure I find the appropriate lay and Hawaiian kind of you know, clothing for that, for that fun time. Um, the virtual meeting, is just a quick question. I did try to register for the Facebook announcement and was unsuccessful. So um, I will try that again. And if it doesn't work, then I'll get a hold of Albert and just say, hey, it could be, it's a, could be a personal problem, but I did see the scannable uh, code and maybe try something else. The second question I have about it is, will they be doing um, breakout rooms? Is it gonna be similar to what we did in the in-person or is it um, something different um, where voices can be heard? I'll let um, Chief Rosales Correa address the first part if he's able to. And then I would say as far as the format for the second meeting, Director Callahan can weigh in if I get anything off. But my understanding is it will be basically a replication of the first uh, forum that we had, realizing and knowing that we've done additional components since then. So what the... Um, people who participate will have access to is the plan with the further developments that have happened, but it's not necessarily building on the first forum. So you didn't need to go to the first one to engage in the second one. It's another opportunity. Yes, so I will um, take a look at that uh, QR code and I will send uh, Missy the uh, link directly so she can share it to the entire board. And so you all can have it. And then uh, 
just one quick thing you were asking about the rooms we are uh director Callahan and myself were working on preparing to get the meeting set up because this one will uh require breakout rooms and simultaneous interpretation in Spanish Arabic Russian and Vietnamese so this is going to be a little bit more complicated on the back end because everybody will be in the same room listening to Lauren but other languages that need interpretation will have a different channel that will be listening to their respective language of choice and uh, those will be the breakout rooms and this will be also during the breakout sessions but i'll make sure to get you that link today it's a similar setup if you engaged in the comprehensive boundary um, adjustment process last year where we had the different channels uh director callahan anything to clean up about what i said uh, the only thing I would add is uh, if those who are at the first community forum can certainly join the second with different people, you're going to get different inputs. So, uh, but it is essentially, as Superintendent Owen said, it's the same format, same structure, same content with the add ins. Great. Jam packed reports, uh, Chunk. Um, thank you all for your hard work on preparing those reports and presenting them here to us tonight. Let's work through some confirmation items before we can, before we take a break. Um, can I hear a motion to approve confirmation items? So moved. I'll second. Excellent. All those in favor, raise your hand and say aye. 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 I think that was everybody. Um, fantastic. We have confirmed all the confirmation items. At this point, we're going to take a short break. Um, but then after the break, the board will be in recess to meet as the local contract review board. And the regular board meeting will resume after the local contract review session is finished. So let's take a, let's see what time is it? Oh boy. Um, let's take a seven minute break. Um, is that good? And then we'll come back and we'll meet in the local contract review. Thank you, everyone. That's by my clock. Let's uh, keep it going here. So the first thing up for um, this body, the local contract review board is a finding of facts. Um, and I believe Mr. Scott Rose will be doing that. All right, good evening. I'm going to share my screen here, uh, which is the findings of fact and the and uh, the local contracting review board should have a copy of these findings. So uh, this is something that the, uh, the you acting as the local contractor review board has seen uh, two other times during the course of the last two years. Uh, what is called the construction manager general contractor method or CMGC. Uh, that's what's being proposed in this findings of fact that it remains to be a very competitive process, but also very efficient as we take a look at costs and we take a look at schedule. Uh, the CMGC method has been used successfully by Centennial, and I've highlighted it here, for the middle school conversion projects and currently with the Centennial High School Athletic Improvements projects. Both of those are under a CMGC process. Uh, the middle school uh, conversion projects for both uh, uh, Centennial and Oliver Middle Schools, uh, that resulted in both projects getting done on time, below budget, and of high quality. The athletic improvements project is early in that particular uh, project, but we've already received cost estimates from them, um, extensive reviews of the site. Uh, they have only technically been on contract about two weeks, so they have done a mountain of work in that time frame. Now, both of these projects happen to be the same CMGC, Emmerich Construction, uh, but this would be going out for an RFP to, um, you know, uh, put that out to CMGC contractors and see what partner that we would get. Uh, it might be Emmerich Construction that's uh, shown a lot of interest in doing a lot of work in this uh, district, or it might be another qualified one. CMGC, the, the, the primary premise of CMGC 
is that they are coming on during the design phase rather than waiting for all the projects to be designed and then just bidding it. Uh, the, the benefit of that is they're able to run cost estimates for us. They're able to do uh, on-site investigation behind walls, above ceilings, that kind of thing, and really explore it and make sure that they uncover uh, most of the unforeseen components so that we are going moving forward in a very informed manner. And where we're, we're proposing to utilize them is on primarily the body of work that's been presented to us in the last, I'll say, um, six to eight weeks. Uh, some of the ESSER funded work, specifically some of the asbestos abatement components uh, and some of the door and window projects. And then also uh, for the bond program contingency uh, items, specifically exterior lighting, uh, the Centennial High School restrooms, and some of the uh, miscellaneous associated work. But a lot of this work is interdisciplinary, needing a general contractor because it's three or four trades. Uh, it's very redundant, meaning we wanna create an equity between all sites and as such, it's a very re repeatable format. Um, and it is uh, across multiple sites around the district. In some cases, for instance, exterior lighting, as many as six of the sites. And so having the consistency of one general contractor that approaches all of that is um, very desirable. So again, uh, the Centennial School District has done this process. And as I've shared on the prior two occasions, lots of school districts in the state utilize this process, but it does require the local contract review board to say, yes, rather than waiting for a design and hard bidding this out to, uh, blindly to the public, we're gonna utilize a CMGC. And then that entity will bid it out to subcontractors. So that entity does very little of the, of the I'll say, uh, um, swing the hammers, if you will. They are primarily the managers of that and bidding it out to subcontractor trades. And then all of those bids are made transparent to the district. So the district's able to see all of the subcontracting bidding that's going on. We influence who they get bids from. In fact, we've had that conversation recently with your CMGC for the athletic improvements. We've identified certain earth movers that are local that we want them to get bids from, certain electricians we want them to get bids from that are local as well. So we're able to better influence who they solicit from, and then they'll certainly solicit from others as well in the industry. Um, so again, ORS 279C.335 does require that this get approved by a local contract review board, which is in this case, the school board of directors um, before proceeding with that. And so in our findings of facts, we're identifying what the, uh, the scope is. Um, we've had impacts, we, we continue to have impacts with COVID-19 in terms of crew availability, in terms of material availability. And one of my concerns in trying to get, a, if you will, get ahead of the ongoing inflation is to try and get this work accomplished primarily this coming summer, summer of 23. But in order to do that, I need to get somebody on board really quickly where we can get some materials ordered, even while some of the design build activities are still being fleshed out. So for instance, exterior lighting, I'd love to get lighting purchased in the next 30 days, because lighting's about four months out. And so as an example, so in order to be able to leverage that, we need to move in the, uh, very quickly. Um, responsibility is the CMGC firm, they have to look at the constructability during the design phase. Uh, what is nice about these is there are many elements that are part of, I'll say what we've already done. For instance, asbestos abatement at the ceiling and floor surfaces. We know the materials already that we want to put back. We want them to be the same as we put in in other schools already at Oliver, at CMS and so forth. And so the idea would be to be able to do this in more of a design build fashion want that abatement done and we want these specific two by two ceiling tiles put in in these three schools, just like we did at CMS, here's the exact product we want. So we keep that consistency, maintain that consistency around you, around the buildings. Um, the bid process, as I mentioned, will be very, um, very open, but they will be conducting the bid process to trades versus us conducting the bid process to general contractors. Um, then, then the construction phase, of course, What's nice about CMGC is they can break this out into multiple phases themselves still to accomplish the end goal. So if there's work that can proceed earlier rather than later, they can do that while they're waiting for materials on the other phases. So they're able to leverage uh, the materials that they can get readily here. Um, in terms of utilizing the CMGC process, 
uh, there are multiple contractors that are available uh, to do CMGC. We would put this out for an RFP. Uh, an RFP would be done in a fashion where we'd be looking at qualified bidders or qualified contractors. We would shortlist to uh, two or three and then interview those and then make a selection. Uh, and they would be giving us what their fee would be. Their fee is based on a percentage of what the construction cost would be. And so we would evaluate the fees to make sure that we're getting a very competitive fee. And again, that was done just in December with the athletic improvements project at Centennial High School, uh, where we received that. We wouldn't have the actual construction cost because they bid that out to the subcontractors, but we would have their fees and those fees would be fixed. Uh, in terms of uh, the construction budget, by um, helping to uh, tailor the subcontracting market to specifically our locals, we give locals more opportunity uh, to bid on the work. And we are not obligated to take all subcontractor bids when they come in. If there are subcontractor bids that are higher than our established budget, we can say we're going to award these portions, but we're not going to award these portions. CMGC, go back out and get more sub bids. So we have the flexibility of doing that rather than just accepting a lump sum bid on bid day. We're able to pick and choose the subcontracts that we award to. And that gives the district a lot of flexibility um, uh, in, in trying to drive cost down. And, and cost, <laughs> costs are quite an issue right now um, within the market. Um, again, this remains a very competitive process. Um, we will be utilizing value engineering techniques um, with the CMGC specifically uh, as it relates to the constructability of it is what is the most efficient way to do this. We're, we're starting to explore that even a little bit right now ahead of the process when we're looking at the replacement of doors and windows. Uh, there's a, a goal of the district to make our windows operable, make sure that we have increased or improved ventilation in classrooms. And it's very expensive to sort of take out a wall of windows and put in a new wall of windows. So we're looking to see whether or not we can add operable hoppers in some of the fixed pane locations and leave the rest of the framing system. It allows us to stretch those dollars and affect more classrooms. And so I've brought out uh, Southtown Glass as a tradesperson to come out and take a look at that, what could be done in a very cost-effective manner that allows us to affect more classrooms. And we would take that information and feed that to the CMGC and they would bid it in such a fashion they could make that happen pretty quickly. Um, as we take a look at uh, specialized expertise, the, they would be working in occupied sites for part of this, because I imagine some of this work may happen, may start as early as May. A lot of it's gonna happen over the summer what we need is somebody that can manage themselves across multiple sites. We'll be saying, okay, we need doors and windows replaced at six sites. And they're gonna to need to be able to manage that effort, that cleanup effort, that mobilization effort, that coordination with summer school activity, et cetera. So, we, so by going with the CMGC process, we can specifically put in the request for proposals that we need somebody that has multi-site experience, a successful multi-site experience, so that we get a, a well-managed job, which is huge. And obviously safety comes into play as well. Um, uh, while most of the work will happen during the summer, we still have those buildings off occupied. Uh, we have them occupied with our, with uh, some of our staff, our custodial staff, we have summer school programs, we have athletic programs at the high school level. So all those things still need to be coordinated even though we're in the, in the summertime. But the complexity of, for instance, just doing the abatement, to abate a ceiling is, we have to take down the electrical devices. We have to abate the ceiling. We have to put back up the ceiling tiles. We have to put in new lighting devices, uh, fire alarm devices, et cetera. And those have to be tested out and commissioned. And so there's a variety of things that need to take place. For the district to just release abatement, we have all these peripheral things that also need to take place. And so we really need a general contractor that can sort of manage that you know, nuts to bolts and make sure they get the people in when they need to get in. And so there is a complexity involved with that, that if we release individual trade permits, um, it would be more uh, problematic. That is not to say that the district isn't releasing individual trade permits. The uh, design for the um, second tier of roofing replacement at the high school, that design is complete and that'll go out on the street pretty quickly. That will be outside of the CMGC process. It's purely roofing and easy to, to break apart uh, separately. Uh, also the cooling projects that we've been looking at. Uh, those we have been leveraging existing mechanical contractors 
and bring driving those prices down and being able to award those as well. So we're excited about some of those individual trade projects, but these get a little bit more messy. Doors aren't just pulling off a door and putting in a new door. There's all sorts of finishes that have to uh, be accommodated with that, the electronic hardware in some cases, uh, and uh, and the floor finishes and thresholds for ADA clearances. So there's a lot of parts and pieces and a CMDC would help make that go a lot smoother. Um, uh, it will not affect the sources of funding at all. Part of this funding for this work will happen through the ESSER funds, federal ESSER funds, and part of it will happen with uh, the bond program contingency that the board designated for particular projects last month. Uh, will we be able to better control the impact of market conditions? That becomes a really difficult thing or has become a real difficult thing really over the last, the, the, the uh, breadth of your bond. So. Congratulations that you're able to have gotten all your bond promises taken care of um, with your budget because it has been it has been just a, a terrible market really for for construction. Um, so this will allow us to again, as I mentioned, we don't have to award all the subcontracts or sub bids at one time. Those that are on budget, we can award and get them going. Those that are over budget, we can ask the CMGC to rebid those or to seek out additional bidders. And so that does allow us to control the overall impact of the market by picking and choosing who we're utilizing on each project. And again, with a lot of focus on locals where we can, uh, electrical and, and dirt work, again, we had those conversations as recently as today. Uh, we've discussed the complexity and tech, uh, technical aspects. I won't go into that in great level of detail, um, nor the construction renovation piece. Uh, I've mentioned how uh, they will be occupied throughout the course of construction. So we need somebody that's actually experienced in that. We don't, it, that's difficult to specify. I want somebody with experience when you're hard bidding a project, you're just putting it out there and you're getting a bid, it's a lump sum bid of X dollars and you can't disqualify them because they don't have a lot of experience in occupied sites in a hard bid scenario. In a CMGC process, that's actually one of the evaluation criteria that we use to score them, whether they've done that or not. So we're scoring the quality of the contractor rather than being forced to take a low bid. And that's that's really a great advantage of the CMGC. Um, it will be multiple phases throughout the course of, I'll say, May through August and probably into September a little bit. Um, we do have, <laughs> uh, I have a lot of experience with CMGC, but um, uh, to the good or bad or, or uh, a desire or, or lack of desire, uh, your school district personnel is starting to really develop experience with CMGC. Um, and quite honestly, I think they really like it because again, middle school conversion projects went really well. Um, so uh, in summary, um, I do believe we're gonna generate cost savings by going through a CMGC process. Um, we're going to reduce the schedule risk, not eliminate it completely because material lead times are still an issue. But by phasing it, I think that we can buy some materials ahead of others, and that's going to help with our schedule risk. Uh, we will be picking a qualified firm that actually works on occupied buildings and can work on multiple building campuses at one time. Uh, we will get better cost data because we'll actually um, uh, get up above the ceilings and the walls and such and things that typically architects and engineers don't do as well as a CMGC contractor would. Um, we'll have much better information early on about how uh, what things will meet our schedule, and what things are gonna spill into the fall. I anticipate that there will be some material lead time issues. And so the quicker we get somebody on, the better. Um, and I do believe, I mean, typically CMGC firms are quality firms. They, they don't get to that level where they're competing against qual qualifications based, you know, as opposed to just bids. You don't get to that level of competing uh, on a quality basis unless you are a quality firm. So again, per ORS 279C335, uh, this board is uh, authorized to allow us to pursue a CMGC process. If the board elects to do that this evening, then we will put an advertisement in the paper for next Wednesday. I have to place it this Friday. Um, and then we'll have an RFP out on the street. We'll uh, have that out for a couple of weeks and then uh, go through an evaluation process. Questions? I know we're wanting to um, move as quickly as we can. So I appreciate that. Um, Scott, I did have one quick question. Um, you, you highlighted a lot of reasons why we should do this. Are there any reasons 
potential reasons why we would not want to go this route? That is a great question. Uh, the reason that you have this particular review board is that there are some contractors, some general contractors that um, do not have CMDC experience. And as such, they would view themselves as being excluded from this process. Gotcha. They would say, hey, I've, you know, I've never done a CMGC, and if I turned in my response to an RFP, I wouldn't get selected. And as such, I'm not going to be able to be part of this. Uh, however, those general contractors could do some of the work that the CMGC would bid out. Um, you know, for instance, the doors and windows, um, some of the finishes put back, things like that. That is stuff that they're qualified to do. And I have had on occasion where a general contractor will subcontract to a smaller general contractor for things like putting in the doors or putting in the windows. So it does still allow them the ability to subcontract, but that is typically the one pushback that we hear from, from um, uh, contractors that might be on your, your meeting tonight. I don't know if there's anybody waiting to do public comment, is that they don't feel that um, they're allowed to compete for the general, the general contract work because they're not experienced in CMPC. Anything else coming up for folks? Is there anybody on for public comment? Do we know? No. I see two attendees, uh, but they look like employees, Brandy and Mitzi. Okay. Um, any, like we can go around um, and see if any, if their directors have comments or questions, I'll do a real quick based on where you are. Um, in my thing, Director Hardin, I'm going to call on you first. No comments or questions. Thank Same you. Director Andrews. Nope, none from me. Director Gregory. None from me either. And Director Shields. None from me. Sounds great. Let's take a vote. Um, let's see, looking for a motion to approve and pursue the CMGC process for ESSER projects. Motion to approve the CMGC process for these projects. Second. All those in favor, raise your hand and say aye. 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 It's unanimous. The ayes have it. Um, we will be utilizing the CMGC process. Thank you so much for your time, Scott. Thank you. Um, at this point, the regular board meet meeting is resuming. Um, and we are always very diligent about our questions, and I know that we want to get the right answers, but I also want to make sure that we all, um, that we can be respectful of everyone's time this evening. So, um, let's move through board action items. Um, there's a few items in old business. Uh, looks like Paul, are you up first for approval of additional service requests? I believe I am. Thank you, Chair Slavsky. Um, So before you for consideration this evening is the approval of additional service requested by RNC management for continuing on with the bond projects, also uh, managing our ESSER below the line projects uh, and other projects that we're doing in the district. So RNC management's been a great partner over the last couple of years, and they were supposed to wrap up our bond project work at the end of last calendar year in November of 2022. So Scott, as you see tonight, has stayed on and RNC has continued on the job, uh, but they have uh, exceeded their contract. And so uh, before you this evening is an approval for approving additional fees to continue on and um, help us manage the uh, both the unexpected uh, additional work. So in addition to keeping all the, the promises in our original bond, we're able to do uh, an additional $4 million worth of projects. So we need help managing those. And then we have the ESSER uh, projects the, uh, funded by the American Rescue Plan to improve school safety. So that's another approximately $4 million worth of projects. Uh, in sum, the request is a total of $774,807 uh, split, as you see in the board note, amongst the three different line items and to have uh, RNC management continue on the job through October 30th, 2023. Uh, the administration recommends the board of directors approves the awards for additional services to RNC management group 
in the amount of $774,807 and a contract extension through October 30th, 2023 for all current and below the line and ESSER projects and including uh, the Palview Seismic Project, uh, which will happen next summer. So moved as presented. Second. It has been moved and seconded that we approve the uh, extension of the contract. Are there any um, thoughts, comments, questions? I had a quick question. Uh, do these extra funds come out of bond funds or does it come? Great question, Director Harden. So they would come out of each group respectively. So the uh, continuation on for the original bond projects would come out of that budget. The uh, fee for the ESSER service would come out of the ESSER funding. And then the below the line fees would come out of the below the line budget, project budget. Does that make sense? So we would, that's why we're out that way as well, because there are three distinct uh, actions and they have some separate funding. Okay, thank you for clarifying. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. Thank you. I welcome any other questions anyone may have. All right, let's go ahead and take a vote. All those in favor, raise your hand and say aye. 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 One, two, three. All right. Unanimous, the ayes have it. We're going to go ahead and extend that contract. So thank you very much, Director Southerton. Thank you. And next up, we have um, Dr. Katsuda with the second read of the policies we talked about last time. Mm -hmm. Good evening, everybody. So yeah, in follow up to the questions posed during the first read of this policy, Executive, Executive Assistant Grindle uh, conferred uh, with OSBA and I checked in with legal counsel uh, to confirm their recommendations and then uh, gather information about implications of adding language specific to reporting suspected sexual conduct. Um, to authorities, um, both indicated that it was an option to add the additional language regarding reporting uh, suspected abuse to TSPC and ODE for licensed and classified staff respectively. Um, regardless of whether it's added, the district designee has a legal obligation to report to these entities. And the specific ORS will be hyperlinked as a footnote in the policy as a reference. Um, I provided specific language directly from the ORS. Uh, it's highlighted in yellow uh, that the board has the option of including in the policy AR um, or not to address the, the questions that were posed during the first read. Thank you, Dr. Katsuda. Mm -hmm. At this point, I'll make we'll do a quick round robin and I, I just want to see where people are at um, with this topic um, of approving this tonight um, and then maybe weighing in on adding in more of what is highlighted in yellow to the AR. Um, Director Shields. I think I might have missed you last time. I apologize. No, 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 you didn't. You're fine. Um, it's unfortunate that the people who brought up the questions aren't here tonight to, to address them. Mm -hmm. um, but in light of what I remember, it appears that uh, Dr. Kasuda has covered the questions and concerns that uh, members of the board had had. I actually do like um, on the AR, the addition. I think that just, just a little additional clarification. And I believe that's really what we were looking for. So I feel confident in the way it's being presented and would support uh, approval of both the policy, <clears throat> excuse me, and the AR this evening. Thank you, Director Shields. Um, Director Andrews. I agree with Director Shields. Excellent. Uh, Director Gregory. I am satisfied with uh, Dr. Kitsu's presentation the clarification that I'm, I'm fine. Excellent. And Director Hardin. Yep, I'm fine with the adjustments and I did like the highlighted portion. Great. Let's take a vote on that then. Motion to approve. Motion to approve the policy as presented. 
Second. All those in favor, raise your hand and say aye. 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 Uh, you know, the eyes have it. Motion to approve the AR as presented. Second. All those in favor, raise your hand and say aye. 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 The ayes have it. Um, we have now passed both of those policies. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Going back up to the agenda, apologies. What do we have next? Uh, future agenda items. New business items. Um, anything for that comes up for folks? Director Shields? Um, just quickly back to the whole idea of the a report to ODE. If really something happens and push comes to shove, would it be appropriate just to call a short meeting um, and just have it available for us for a very short meeting to approve if, if uh, Director Callahan finds something different or really needs to bring something to our attention, it might be nice for us to be proactive and just say, you know, hold the date as needed um, and let's work really hard to not have it happen. But I don't want us to not be able to have a quorum if something were to come up and we needed to have a half hour meeting to get this thing um, in at an appropriate time. So that would be my only consideration for maybe the board officers to, to look at is put, a, put something on the calendar for, for a hold. For uh, March 22nd, that when the second Wednesday of that month and the spring break actually isn't until the following week. So I think that that makes sense. Um, that we go ahead and put a hold for yeah half hour, maybe an hour just to play it safe. Um, and hopefully we don't need it. And hopefully it won't take that much time if we do. Thank you, Director Shields. Um, one thing came up to me. So you all know that I started in the middle of the pandemic with all of the meetings on Zoom and we've returned to in-person. There is a piece that I didn't understand the difference between a meeting being open to the public and the public being able to comment. Um, and I've had a few, I've heard a few requests of folks being able to attend the board meetings. I know we've kind of talked about this a little bit before, but uh, there are some pretty good arguments as, as we are continuing to try to build trust between the board, the staff, and the community to really maybe opening some of these, these meetings up so that people can attend them. Um, I know space is an issue. Um, and so I did <clears throat> have an idea that potentially we could um, take the show on the road, so to speak, and, and really put together a calendar of like, one time we're at the high school, one time we're at a middle school, an elementary school, and really kind of making it accessible to the, that community, but then also getting to highlight that school or community um, in that meeting. So it would kind of be a double duty. Um, I just wanted to, bring this up to start having people think about what they, how they feel about that, um, because it was just something that I had heard. Um, go ahead, Director Shields. Uh, if this is something for consideration uh, for maybe potentially next year, we have done that in the past. Okay. And what it did is it created a lot of issues and concerns for the site where yeah. it was having, and because of the new law that requires that we, you know, we broadcast now um, mm -hmm. our meetings. Um, that means we would have to be in a facility where a broadcast could occur. So there's a lot of moving parts. Uh, I I've liked the idea. We liked it when we tried it before, but it just put a lot of stress on the, on the staff that we didn't understand was going to happen. And now we're going to be asking IT to maybe have a little, that would be consideration for that as well. So. If we're thinking about it as next year's, mm -hmm. you know, setting some things up, we would need the lead time and we really would need to find out what the, even the, potentially the um, financial impact would be yeah. of doing such a thing. Um, and that's the whole reason why they are, meetings are available, um, real time, Zoom, 
and available uh, after the fact uh, recording. So I think we've we've come a long way. Um, mm -hmm. It's not to say we can't do uh, additional and better, but we do need to think about staffing and costs. Great, thank you, Director Shields. Director Andrews. I have a friend who's on the school board at North Clackamas and um, they have had very, very, very contentious board meetings to the point that she is no longer attending the board meetings in person mm -hmm. um, because she feels physically threatened and her family feels threatened. I would hate, well, actually, I probably wouldn't stay on the board if that thing started happening in our district. I, I don't expect that the people who would attend our board meetings would be that way, but I wouldn't expect that from North Clackamas either. Um, so uh, that's something, I, I like the format that we have now. And I feel like by attending many other meetings that we host, I meet a lot of people throughout the district. Um, I'll, I'll just say I like the format that we have now. Great. Thank you. Um, I think that uh, given that maybe we'll take it to, I'll bring it to the board leadership meeting um, and we can talk about whether it's something that we even want to consider at this time for the remainder of this year or potentially moving forward. Um, and between now and then, if anybody has thoughts or comments or feelings, I welcome them to reach out to me and share them. Um, not just board members, staff members, if there's things that I'm not thinking of, I would love um, your advice and input as well. So thank you. James, you want to hit us with some future agenda items? Sure thing. So what we've got on the schedule for next meeting is uh, fall athlete recognition. We have the CMS HVAC cooling for the two-story addition that was referenced earlier. Um, we have student transfer limits that need to be established for the 23-24 school year. So there will be a presentation followed by a board action uh, relative to that. The MESD local service plan is due for uh, board review and consideration. Um, COVID-19 leave, we had COVID-19 leave negotiated with license and um, we would like to extend that leave out across employee groups and not just with licensed. And so Dr. Katsuda is working with uh, OSEA and then also our non-represented groups around um, just extending that out. And so there should be some board action relative to that, uh, provided the OSCA ratifies that, um, which I believe that they're in the process of going through now. Um, I, if I'm not mistaken, Key Club has a field trip uh, for the agenda for next time. I see uh, Missy shaking her head. And then just as a brief update, the superintendent evaluation process, I talk with board leadership about it. And um, in essence, I need to just type it up and send it out um, to the board. Um, we figured that at this point, um, it's probably just better for me to just email the board what we're thinking um, rather than take up time at the meeting. But of course, if after you see what is provided, uh, you have questions, feel free to reach out and we can consider uh, our next steps. And that is my list. Yes, Director Shields. In, in light of what our conversation was as it related to um, music, the arts and theater, if uh, Director Callahan does come across um, research and information that would be helpful for us to, you know, again, get a base understanding of what we're talking about, because it, it has felt like it's a big interest of this board to move forward in these kind of ways, um, the more information that we have readily available to us when we are working in the budget, you know, process as well, budget meetings and those conversations are happening there, that we would want our, <clears throat> excuse me, our budget um, members to have uh, access to that same kind of information so that they would feel inclusive. It's not like just a board topic. This is inclusive of us um, as, a, as a budget and community um, group. So yeah, I just really would appreciate you helping me have a better understanding of what the literature is supporting. Thank you. I had one. Um, 
uh, I was just curious if there's any thought or interest in any board coffees coming up. We had pre-established the board coffees for the year. Good question. Um, I was just looking at that today, in fact, and the board coffees are scheduled for March, I believe. Uh, March 15th, and then we have another round on May 10th. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. There's a lot going on, so I think it's just good good to check in every once in a while. Great. I see a finger from Director Shields. <laughs> um, it would be helpful, maybe just as a reminder, and we can put this in um, an email, possibly deadlines for um, board candidacy. Because um, we've got a lot of um, open positions. It's good to remind those of us who are on the board right now um, those who us, of us who may be um, looking at, you know, people who would be reviewing this. Um, and I know that we had talked previously about the fact that we do have people who have expressed interest in the board. And um, Roger, are you going to go? Are you going to do a go <laughs> for, for the position? Just so we, we know, because um, it would be nice to make sure that we have a full list of candidates. Um, sure. applicants, sure. not can, no, candidates, right? Because it's an election, so we change the terminology for this. Okay. And then who of us are going to do this okay. again? Okay, if I can have just a couple minutes. Um, let me preface what I'm going to say is that I have enjoyed immensely this time on the board. It's been a real learning experience for me. Um, there have arisen some things over the last few months. Um, some personal issues regarding my health, my wife's health. Um, my workload at my employment has increased dramatically since November. Um, there is a possibility that my office is going to be relocated to the west side of the metro. Mm -hmm. That will um, increase, effectively increase by the commute to the west side, uh, the length of my work day. Um, not trying to play the ageist card necessarily, but I am in the latter stages of life. I don't have the energy I did as a young man when I worked two jobs simultaneously in my 30s, where I would finish a night shift at 11, be back at the next one at 7.30 in the morning. Um, there is a distinct possibility that were I to declare and run for the two years remaining in this term to go to June 2025, there's a good chance I would not be able to finish it out and have to leave early. And I do not want to place the board in the position of having to yet conduct another round of recruitment, interviews, appointing someone to fill something that I could not finish. I don't believe in good conscience I could run this coming year and for the, to be elected, attempt to be elected to position seven to go to June 2025. So, after giving it all careful consideration, I am planning on being finished June 30th. When the appointment is up, I will not, I do not intend at this point to run as a candidate for position seven. So if there are people of expressed interest serving on the school board, more than welcome. I, I wish it was, did not have to come to this type of decision. As I say, I just feel like I'm starting to learn things. It's been a great experience. It's been very helpful and welcoming, but I'm, I feel like I can't in good conscience do it. So I'm not going to be a candidate this summer. Well, thank you for your honesty and your, you know, putting that out there. It has been so wonderful to have you and your experience on the board for the time that you've been here. And so I just really want to thank you for jumping in in the middle and not knowing what you're even getting yourself into. Um, and I can tell that, uh, you've been really thoughtful and intentional about everything that you've done here on the board um, and every vote that you take and every comment that you make. Um, there's a lot of thought and intention behind that. So I see that. I see you. And I just appreciate you, Director Gregory. Well, thank you very much for the kind words, Chair Swap. Yeah, I certainly appreciate all who take the time to serve and not only the represented, but non-represented employees and the district leadership administration, public education is not an easy field to work in these days. So I do appreciate everyone's effort. Yeah, 
Thank you. Um, so that said, the window of de a declaration of candidacy is between Saturday, February 4th and Monday, March 20th. Oh no, that's the day candidate statements are due. Um, I think that we, we do have some timelines put out there and I wonder if um, we could um, ask maybe for some support from um, Alberto or somebody on the team as far as like putting together some social media posts that then we could then share out with our own communities around getting folks engaged. Um, Director Andrews. I'm on a different topic. Do, do you want to finish off that topic first before Great. I move? Uh, Chief Rosales Correa, are you there? Um, I just was wondering if you had some ideas about the social media piece. Yeah, I'm right here. Can you hear me? Yep. Yeah. yeah, so yeah, for sure. Uh, what I can do is uh, work with Missy and prepare some kind of uh, communication that's going to be shared periodically from now to the uh, opening date of the term in uh, February and then have those go out periodically, which will be directing them to the website and then also to any of the links that are uh, needed as far as running for the district. And they, we actually already have some information on the district's uh, board page that has some content as far as, uh, and links uh, about what it, uh, it entails to be a board member and they can read the bios and things like that. And uh, we can come up with something for sure. Great, thank you so much. One more comment about that. Um, the uh, OSBA is running a fairly good campaign, Get On Board is the title of it. Um, and as long as we're linking up, if that link is on our webpage as well, that would really be, that's a really helpful one. Lots of embedded videos, um, lots of written materials. And then um, if we then will add to that list of these are the expectations for our own calendar, because we'll be setting our own calendar out um, for next year as well. So people know what they're signing up for, yeah. <laughs> you know, in if, time. So thank you all. If I, if I may, uh, yeah, so there's a, in the last superintendent's update, we actually shared some of that information and those are also linked on the uh, district's website and the board section, but for sure we can keep on uh, promoting that as needed. Great, thank you. Director Andrews. I wanted to mention that I attended um, the Senator Wyden's town hall at Gresham High School last week. And I guess I didn't quite understand that I was attending as an elected official and sat with other elected officials right in the front of the auditorium. A um, couple of county commissioners, uh, city councilors, other school board members. But it was, it was very interesting. And the reason I raise it is because it was at Gresham High School it was at 9.30 in the morning and half the audience were students. And they had the Q&A set up such that there would be one community member ask a question and then one student ask a question. It would be, I, I have no idea how they decided to go to Gresham other than they have a brand new auditorium, but it would be fantastic if we could host a town hall, not necessarily Senator Wyden's, but some anybody else at Blumenauer, who of course is a Centennial graduate, wanted to have a town hall. It would be great to have it at Centennial and have students there and have students asking questions and engaging in the process, it was, and the students asked, at least for the most part, they were asking really profound and um, thoughtful questions. It was very interesting. And that was one of the things Wyden wanted to do was to have student voice at all of his town halls. And he's had town halls in every county. So I, I was so pleased to attend and to realize that his Multnomah County town hall was in Gresham. I thought that was fantastic. Yeah. Interesting timing and in that you should mention that. I see uh, <laughs> Missy uh, smiling a little bit because we were just approached yesterday about hosting a town hall. Missy, can, do you have more details that you could share? I do, as a matter of fact. Um, I just received a phone call. I'm going to actually pull up the email here so um, I'm more accurate in what I say. And I just want to make sure that... Um, let me see if I can find it here real quick. My apologies. I can pull it up. I've got it. Oh, you can. Great. Yeah. 
there it is. So this is who I was contacted by, uh, Sarah. And she's, as you can see, a legislative aide for some representatives in the House districts. Um, and because we sit between Gresham and Portland or in the middle of both, she thought our district would be a great district to host a joint town hall. And so um, she wants about delivering 2023 legislative priorities and do some Q&A and that kind of stuff. It sounds like it was an evening event, however, so I'm not sure if she had a lot of thoughts about bringing students involved, but that may be something that we want to go ahead and discuss with her. Uh, she did indicate that the they're looking to host an event on February 9th, which is just literally right around the corner. And I know we've got so many other things going on. So I was a little, I certainly didn't commit to anything by all means. But um, anyway, this is kind of what we got reached out this week about. So it's funny that we just talked about it a little bit. Oh, Rose, you're on mute. Good thing, because you probably could have read my lips. And when I realized I was muted, I may have said something out loud that I shouldn't have. Um, that is... Wonderful. And we do have a core planning meeting on the evening of February 9th. And so I think that um, responding and seeing if they could be flexible with their dates, that this is something we would love to do, but we already are in the process of strategic planning and have something planned that evening. Yes, go ahead. So um, maybe some of you know, this is so fantastic that they would ask this, but it would be great to do it during the school day because one win and Andrea Valderamas have both been, and I think one is still on the school board of David Douglas, but she wants to move forward um, to enable 16 year olds to vote in the state. And it would be so fantastic to have a forum on that topic at Centennial High School and, and have our students participate in a, in a conversation about something like that. And what would it mean? And, and are they supportive? And oh, that would, uh, excellent. Let's do it, but maybe not on the ninth. We'll, we'll interact with their office and uh, get more detail. And I'm, I imagine that Mr. Miller and uh, Dr. Ramberg with CVA could help promote with students as well. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Thank you, everyone, for hanging in there. It was a long one. We got through lots of business today. I appreciate you all. Uh, this meeting is adjourned at 924 p.m. Enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you.